a new appropriations and new budget plan. This is in keeping with what we have been practicing on the temporary extensions of the budget with the formula that we've used to use last year's figures or the new ones, whichever are lower, if you recall. This is the kind of process that I think we should have in a permanent budget process that would require a ton of waivers on your part, but I would ask that it be made in order. Mr. Salomon. <laughs> Mr. Gingas, you've been coming before this committee for many, many years now, and uh, certainly one of these days we hope you'll be successful because yours would go a long way towards turning this sea of red ink around and bringing some kind of fiscal sanity to this, uh, to this body, and uh, we'll do everything we can to help you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Quillen, did you have a question? Thanks. And Mr. Dreyer, did you have any questions? Uh, yes, sir. I want to thank you for the excellent testimony and to say that I was uh, very impressed by it. And we hope we can make your amendment in order. I'm going to submit a uh, written uh, statement to you directly from your office. And I, I'd like a response. <laughs> okay, I believe that uh, Mr. Collins of Georgia is next. Please do uh, have your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee this afternoon to offer what I consider to be a very important amendment to the budget reconciliation package. I think that most of us will agree that planning and education is one of the most important factors in securing a future in our competitive society. Learning the basics and obtaining a strong background for understanding prepares us to meet the challenges that we will face throughout our personal and professional lives. In my home state of Georgia, 55 percent of those over the age of 25 do not have a high school education. On a national level, that statistic is a little better, but still alarming. Forty percent of those over the age of 25 years of age have not, not graduated from high school. Those statistics worsen still when we look at the poverty level of citizens receiving federal assistance. The lack of education is a dominant factor among those who are on welfare dependence. According to the Department of Health and Human Resources, only 19.3% of adult recipients of aid to families with dependent children benefits have graduated from high school. That means that over 80% of those receiving AFDC funds have not had a basic education. Studies have shown that without an adequate education, poverty and welfare dependence perpetuates itself, passing from one generation to the next. There's a strong need to create incentives that will provide people with the necessary tools that will enable them to walk away from welfare, federal assistance, and into a productive, self-sustaining job. My amendment creates an incentive for welfare-dependent adults to help their children obtain a necessary foundation for their future, a high school education. This amendment would require that a high school-aged child whose legal guardian receives AFDC benefits must attend school, participate in a home study program, or meet the state's minimum requirements for obtaining the equivalence of a high school diploma. If the child failed to meet the state enrollment requirements, and the legal guardian would lose the FDC benefits allotted for that particular child. We must begin to address other needs of citizens that receive federal assistance. By offering an education incentive, we'll be providing them an added opportunity for a better future. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and ask that the committee include this amendment. This will be one small step toward welfare reform, but I think it will be one giant step toward developing an educated workforce for the future. Thank you for your testimony, and I would ask Mr. Solomon if he has any questions. <laughs> well, Mac, I just want to commend you uh, for <laughs> bringing this amendment uh, to our committee. Uh, it makes an awful lot of sense, and as you said, it's been, uh, it was your amendment that uh, has been now tried in Georgia. Uh, I'm just reminded of, uh, of a bill that I passed a couple of years ago, uh, which uh, I had taken from another state, and sometimes these states really do have the answers, and we should pay more attention to them, just like you're bringing to us. And uh, uh, I took a, a New Jersey law, which uh, had uh, revoked the driver's licenses of anyone convicted uh, of a drug felony, and uh, they removed over 12,000 
drug offenders from the highways in just one year. And now, because of what they did and seeing their success, we have copied that and we've said we're going to withhold aid from the, uh, from, the, from the states unless they enact this same kind of law. And now they're enacting this law all over the country. And uh, that will do more to young people uh, who become 16 years of age and they realize they're going to lose their driver's licenses. And that means more to them than anything else in the world. And this kind of uh, uh, carrot is the same thing. Uh, and I think it'll bring the same kind of results. So I admire you for it. We'll do everything we can to make it in order. Well, I thank you, gentlemen, for his comments. And uh, it is an incentive. It's an incentive for the parent to uh, assist that child. Uh, and it, it's set out in the beginning of FY95, which gives them at least one year to understand that this is going to take place and uh, prepare for that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quillen? No, I uh, you have a good amendment, and I hope that this committee will consider it. Okay, Mr. I regret right, this morning I didn't have any time to yield on the floor of the Home Rule, but uh, certainly if this committee makes your amendment in order, you'll have ample time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mac, what you've done here is provided uh, us the opportunity to deal uh, with what I think is clearly a national security issue. If we're going to compete in the world market today, we obviously have to improve the quality of education. And uh, obviously that opportunity is, uh, is not being seized by many. And you are providing a very important incentive for people here. And I wholeheartedly support the amendment and hope very much that we'll be able to make it in order. And I congratulate you for being here and appreciate your testimony. Well, I, I appreciate that. As I uh, should... Uh the White House not too long back was over there for reception and went through the receiving line. I spoke directly to the President about welfare reform and I mentioned this amendment and I mentioned the fact that we had uh, passed this same amendment in Georgia and that we have many, many steps that we've got to make to, to have welfare reform in this nation if we're going to take people off of the, the welfare rolls and put them on the payrolls, whether become productive taxpaying people rather than tax receiving people. I th again thank the the committee chairman and the committee for indulging my comments and hopefully yeah. you'll see fit to approve this amendment for possible passage. Yeah, well thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we now have we have three other members who are here I believe who want to appear as a group and thank, thank you, you for appearing. Um, Toby Roth, uh, Chris Smith and uh, Dennis Hastert. And do you have, is, is there anyone else who wants to appear with you? Is there anyone else who wants to appear with you, or are the three of you? Uh, well, yeah. I, I'd like to, but I'll stay up here. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Well, let you uh, let you proceed as you wish. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Quillen, Mr. Dreyer, and uh, members of the committee. We're delighted to be here this afternoon, and we want you to know that uh, you've been here for a long time. We realize that, and. Thank you for allowing us to appear. Uh, I testify today as chairman of the Task Force on Social Security uh, of the House Republican Committee. Uh, our task force has held two detailed hearings uh, on this uh, issue. We've listened to the leaders of senior citizens groups from around the country. We've heard from uh, seniors, thousands of them from around the country, and we received thousands of, uh, thousands of letters from our senior citizens. And their message is clear. Uh, senior citizens view this tax not only as unfair, but that it breaks a pledge that the government has made with our senior citizens on Social Security. <coughs> if this tax goes through, nine and a half million seniors will pay more in taxes next year, as much as $483, which will be the average that they'll be paying. Married individuals earning as little as $16,000 a year will be paying more in Social Security taxes. These are middle class people. Let me repeat, repeat, these are middle class people, not rich. Moreover, raising tax, the tax to 85% would tax people twice, really, because Americans would be taxed first when they pay Social Security taxes as employees, and again, when their Social Security benefits are paid. Now, this tax would discourage private savings at a time when we Americans should be saving, and when we want to encourage seniors to save for their retirement. Opposition to this tax is large and broadly based. American people oppose this tax by a margin of 72% to 14. 
according to a national poll. Moreover, senior citizens are very upset that revenues from this tax will not be going to the senior citizen or the Social Security Trust Fund, but instead will be going to the general revenue. And we feel that Social Security should be used for Social Security purposes only. After carefully considering these findings, uh, my fellow task members and I have concluded that the Social Security tax must be stricken, and we ask you to allow us to bring up this amendment and to debate it. Millions of senior citizens across America are asking their representatives for simple fairness. Seniors want to help reduce a deficit, but they know that this is an unfair burden. My, our amendment would give members who have doubts about Social Security tax the opportunity to debate it and to vote on it. I urge you, who are all fair-minded members on this Rules Committee, to allow us to bring up this amendment tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's certainly a privilege to be here today. I know that certainly the marathon work that you're doing today on this uh, uh, issue and this bill will be come before us tomorrow. But I want to uh, support uh, Mr. Ross' amendment to strike the uh, tax on uh, Social Security, increased tax on Social Security benefits uh, contained in the budget reconciliation. The tax increase would certainly hit seniors hard. There are people who make as little as $25,000 as an individual and $32,000 as couples and uh, can expect to pay $438 on average the first year of this tax. It's in addition to the taxes that all Americans are going to have to pay, uh, such as the energy tax that we've been discussing also here today. Uh, the tax is particularly hard-hitting when you combine it with the Social Security earnings penalty. And I've been here uh, numerous times to testify about the uh, earnings test on Social Security, but when you start to add up these taxes. The marginal tax rate, once an individual earns $10,568, is a whopping 103.5%. Imagine a marginal tax at 103.5%. I mean, if we want people, especially people of modest means, to go to work and be productive, and they have to face a type of a penalty at 103.5% marginal tax, you know, you're not going to have anybody working that falls in that category. Uh, they're going to be totally dependent on government and the welfare uh, means that this government uh, will have to put forward and really crimps the idea of people taking care of themselves and being independent, being productive. So uh, I think it's, it's really when you start to tie all these taxes together and all the crimps and crevices that we have in the Social Security tax system, many of them are antiquated and certainly go back to the Depression era. Uh, that we think that uh, it's best, it's a best uh, for seniors in this country, it's a best for productivity in this country, uh, that we would follow uh, Mr. Uh, Ross' lead and uh, certainly uh, strike this from the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just let me add my words of, of encouragement to this committee to uh, make Mr. Roth's proposal in order. It seems to me that we're, we're, we're not asking you to judge necessarily the rightness or wrongness of his proposal, but just give him give us the opportunity and our fellow members and our colleagues to vote on this very important issue that is of very high importance to our senior citizens. I've had uh, seven town meetings um, within the last month and a half. Uh, many of the seniors have come out and I have been amazed as to how well informed they are about the specifics of this proposal. And I think we haven't heard the end of it. We'll hear much more about it if uh, it goes through and becomes law. All is we're asking, the very modest proposal, is let Mr. Roth have the opportunity uh, to offer the amendment and uh, let the chips fall where they may. That's the essence of the democratic process, and it seems to me precluding that uh, is, is contrary to the democratic process. Uh, as has been pointed out, it'll hit middle-income seniors the hardest. Uh, the average will be just under $500 per year uh, for those middle-income seniors, many of whom are just making ends meet. So uh, uh, this is hardly uh, a time to be taxing them even more. So I would hope that the amendment would be made in order. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Solomon. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, let me, uh, I, I wish I were sitting there with these three gentlemen. Uh, uh, Denny Hastert is the chairman of our task force uh, on trying to uh, remove the tax on Social Security benefits. And, you know, under the uh, Reagan-Bush era, we've been partially successful, not as successful as we would like to be, in removing all of the tax because it's not the government's money to tax. I just, um, I became a little uh, aggravated when one member of the Rules Committee, uh, uh, before 
said he was uh, concerned about the equity in the tax code because some of his children, adult children, had to pay a higher tax rate than some people on Social Security. And I said to myself, you know, I must have been raised by the wrong kind of parents. I was raised by my grandparents, and they were both 100% uh, Scotch from Edinburgh, Scotland. And, but they, uh, they once called to me uh, the attention of why Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the, the one Social Security Supplemental Retirement Trust Fund, that one. And what it was, it was the first you know, one before they loaded in all these other hundreds and myriads of, uh, of things into the Social Security system, that one single trust fund. And what it was, was a forced savings account. That's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said it was. It was a forced savings account so that frugal people, people who had worked all their lives, who had been responsible and had saved a little bit every week of their life, and now they reach an age of 62 or 65, they become a recipient of the money that they have paid into this forced savings account. And now we want to raise that tax on them. Well, you know what that means? It means that those of us, and I'm one of them, who uh, got out of the Marine Corps and uh, had five kids with my wonderful wife uh, within seven years, and we had to scrimp and save. My wife stayed home to work to keep, take care of those kids. We only had one earner, making 50 bucks a week, and we had four kids in college at one time. You know, it was painful, but we saved a dollar every single life of our marriage for 37 years. And now people like me, are going to be forced to pay 85% tax on those savings, which is not the government's money in the first place. It is totally outrageous. And certainly, this is an issue that should be debated on the floor of this Congress. Uh, I just hope you have that privilege. I'm afraid that you are not, from what I see after over seven hours of testimony. I'm just afraid of what's going to happen. But I admire and respect the three of you. And we're going to do everything we can. If we don't get the amendment, please come on the floor and please make your point of why you were denied the right to represent your 580,000 people each on the floor of Congress to make this issue. Thank you well, for coming before well, us. Well, as our ranking member, Mr. Solomon, we don't want to give up that easy because I know Mr. Frost from Texas, and I know him to be preeminently fair, and I know he's going to vote with you on this amendment. He's a and, fine gentleman. And we have four members here today. Maybe we could take a vote. Now, I've noticed, um, because I've been in and out of these hearings today, that you always ask about an offset. How are you going to pay for this? I want to answer that question for you, because I know you want to answer, yes. uh, ask it. Consider and, it asked. Yeah, we have $8.8 .8 billion alone in the AID pipeline. As you know from being one of our leading members of the Foreign Affairs Committee, we asked for a GAO study. And we were told that it's a froth of waste and abuse. Right. And uh, even the GAO told us after two years, this money should be deauthorized. This money's been in there as much as 10 years. So right there, we have you know the dollars that we can use. And I can give, be happy to give you other offsets, but uh, more than you'll need. Toby, one point I think you ought to make, and I looked at those offsets, and the offsets uh, in the cuts that you are offering do not cost one single American job as I read it. Is that That's correct? Right. That's correct. Absolutely. In fact, it creates jobs. Good. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Wait a minute. You have some other yeah. questions? Yeah, Mr. Quillen. Well, I think we need more teams like you three expressing a common approach to a problem that is really asinine when they want to tax Social Security recipients. And if we let the tax, tax, tax administration go down the line, they're going to be taxing every dollar that a recipient receives in the future. Because they're looking for under, uh, under the cover to find uh, items that they can tax and people they can tax. So I think it's time we put a stop to it. I know that people now pay a certain, uh, if they have are in a certain income bracket, bracket, pay some Social Security taxes on their Social Security benefit. And that's wrong. Why? Because this Congress has been oh. tax hungry, and it does serve no purpose except to make people 
below the poverty level. So I think it's time that we did something about it, and your approach is accurate and on target, and I support it wholeheartedly. Well, thank you, Mr. Quillen. I, I know you want me to respond by saying that we've seen in our society now where the uh, White House is putting rich against poor. You always hear, we, we're going to tax the rich. We're not going to tax them, we're going to tax the rich. But there's another um, insidious thing that's coming in our society. It's putting uh, demographics, putting senior citizens against young people. And we see that too. And now all of a sudden seniors are being taxed and you're going to see this is only the tip of the iceberg that they're going to come back again and again and again to tax senior citizens. So I appreciate your comments. Well, you know, our senior citizens are living longer. Their longevity is longer than in the past. I don't know whether they're trying to kill our senior citizens off or not, but it seems to me like they're trying to starve them to death. Well, not only that, but we also have this problem with the notch where you have some people being treated unfairly. Why don't we bring that up for a vote? That's been around all over the place. I hear every politician kicking it around like a political football during campaign time. Oh, yes, we're going to have a vote on that. Well, let's bring it up and have a vote on it. Well, I, uh, I prescribe, subscribe to that. I, I've had a bill in to correct that inequity, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem see the light of day. But maybe we can get this amendment made in order. I, Thank you. I'd really appreciate it. Don't give up until it's in order, please. Well, I was in the Navy. We don't give up the ship. All right. Hey, I like that. I like that attitude. Hey, uh, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, the sad thing about this issue is that we, we say to Americans who are forced to pay into the Social Security system, throughout your entire lifetimes, save for retirement. Plan for retirement. Put a little money aside. And then what happens? When they reach retirement, we reward those who have done nothing but consume and haven't saved a nickel in their lifetimes, and we penalize those who have followed our advice and saved and planned for retirement. It seems to me that what you've got here is uh, a very admirable thing. Denny? Mr. Dreyer, if I could uh, comment, not only the people who have unearned income, but also people who have to work on earned income. Right. I mean, some people haven't been as fortunate all their life to save, right. uh, to settle aside large retirements. Those people who have to go out and work right by the sweat of their brow to, to make ends meet, they're the people who are going to be taxed at 103.5% right. marginal tax. It just seems to me that it's, 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 a, it's a real tragedy that we constantly say, don't be reliant on the government upon retirement. So follow our directive and save and plan for retirement. And then once we get there, we penalize those who've done just that and reward those who haven't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, this is uh, a most interesting question, and we will uh, carefully consider your testimony. Thank, thank you, you, and I, I hope you will have our amendment in order. Thank you. Thank you for appearing. Uh, we are going to attempt to, uh, the chair will announce that we're going to attempt to take the witnesses in the order that they appear on our witness sheet, and this is by committee. And uh, the, uh, the next uh, witness on our sheet who is present, as far as I know, is the Honorable Joe Nollenberg uh, from Mr. Michigan. Chairman, yes. I wonder if I could ask a special um, uh, opportunity to testify. I'm in the middle of a markup of the Foreign Assistance Act in uh, appropriations, and I have to get back to yeah, the, the, the chair. The chair would have no objection if the gentleman, no, uh, the gentleman from Michigan has no objection. Do you know what that would help you? I would like to stand He's next to the, uh, Actually, the, uh, uh, the, the group that's here, uh, Mr. Sanders and Mr. Nadler, were, are next after Mr. Nollenberg. And I would, do you have any objection to Mr. Porter proceeding? Or please proceed. I, I really appreciate it, gentlemen. I, I'm okay. sorry. We're, uh, we're pleased to have uh, John Porter from Illinois. Please proceed. Mr. Frost, uh, Mr. Solomon, members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. I will be brief. I request that my taxpayer protection amendment be made in order. It is a very simple amendment. The amendment requires that all new revenues in the reconciliation package go to deficit reduction or be repealed. The message from the American people that all of us are hearing is that they don't want new taxes to cut spending first. But Mr. Chairman, if they have to take new taxes, they want every single penny of the new taxes used for deficit reduction and not for new spending. The budget reconciliation package does not do this. 
Much of the new revenues go for increased and new spending, and there is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that spending will be controlled in the out years. It is clear that without my amendment, we could end up with permanent tax increases and little in the way of deficit reduction. The deficit trust fund, Mr. Chairman, is a phony. It is simply an accounting device. It does not cut spending or raise taxes, and it has no enforcement mechanism whatsoever. My amendment ensures that all new revenues go to reduce the deficit or they are lost. Here's how it would work. If the deficit in any fiscal year is not reduced by an amount equal to or greater than the new revenues collected in that year, then the new revenues are automatically repealed. Is it too much to ask that we use all of the new revenues to reduce the deficit? I don't think so, and a number of organizations do not think so. The following have endorsed this amendment. Americans for a balanced budget, Citizens Against Government Waste, Citizens for a Sound Economy, the Free Congress Foundation, the National Tax Limitation Committee, and the U.S. Business and Industrial Council. I should be here, Mr. Chairman, asking that we have three times as much deficit reduction as new taxes to match the President's campaign promise that there would be $2 of spending cuts for every $1 of tax increases. I'm not even doing that. All this amendment asks is that the deficit reduction be equal to the new taxes imposed. The budget reconciliation package can meet this, but only for one year, the very first year. In the next four years, much of the new tax revenue is used to support increased spending. Exactly what the American people say don't do. Let's get real. I believe that the president is so fearful of being an outsider like Jimmy Carter an irrelevant outsider, that the spenders in this Congress have rolled him, Mr. Chairman, and won't even put forward a package that will guarantee the American people that their new taxes will be devoted to the nation's number one problem, the deficit. I urge this committee to allow me to go to the floor and give the American people the simple assurance that they're going to pay new taxes, every penny of the new taxes will go to reduce the deficit. And then, Mr. Chairman, if that amendment isn't allowed, then the American people will be assured that their new taxes will not go to reduce the deficit. Much of them will go for new spending. I think that's unacceptable. I ask that the amendment be made in order. Thank you, and I would ask, I know that you're on a tight schedule, I would ask if any of the uh, Republican members have questions at this point. Let me just, uh, John, I know you're in a hurry and I'll let you go. I just want to say that, uh, you know, under uh, this Congress, whether under a Democrat or Republican administration in the White House, uh, has never uh, lowered uh, spending when they increase taxes in any given year. Uh, certainly your approach is a way to guarantee it because you write it into law, as I understand it, and it wouldn't be subject to this Rules Committee waiving the Budget Act. Uh, in other words, if they didn't meet the Reduction Act uh, account uh, caps, then the taxes would be rescinded. Instantly. I admire Year you. by year. If well, it doesn't met every year, they would be repealed and have to start over. But not only does it carry the support of all those organizations, it carries my wholehearted support. We'll do everything we can to help you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Solomon. No questions, but I, John, you made some very forceful comment with which I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know that you're on a tight schedule, and I congratulate you for the amendment, and I know that you're in the midst of this foreign ops uh, markup. And so I'm going to ask you to look very closely at the barter language that I've submitted to your committee on the uh, aid to Russia package. I think, when you I go think back I'm there. being lobbied. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We'll look Mr. at it. Then. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Board. I congratulate you for the put up or shut up amendment of the day, as far as I'm concerned. I want to ask you one question. If you were for deficit reduction, why would you be opposed to your amendment? There is no reason. I can't think of one either. There Thank is you. no reason. It simply provides a very easy and strong discipline to get the job done. Obviously, if the amendment isn't made in order, the people here don't want to get the job done. I could reach that conclusion, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, the next witness is Mr. Joe Nollenberg from uh, Michigan. Chairman, 
Members of the committee, Pleased I to appreciate, have you here. appreciate the opportunity to have a, a chance to offer my amendment. The so-called Nolenberg Small Business Tax Fairness Tax Fairness Amendment would cap the individual income tax rate on small business entrepreneurs and farmers at the current maximum of 31 percent. We're talking about the unincorporated, the partnership, the sole proprietorship as well. The amendment language is drafted carefully. It would benefit only those who are actively engaged in small business activities. And as I mentioned, these are the folks that are in the sole proprietorships, the subchapter S uh, partnerships and so forth. All of these business entities pay taxes as individuals, which most people forget about. And as such, will be subject to marginal tax rates as high as 44 percent under the tax bill reported out of the Ways and Means Committee. Now, obviously, the majority on that committee has chosen to ignore the fact that eight of ten small businesses in this country pay taxes as individuals, not as corporations. In my prior life, I ran a small business, and I know a little bit about from what I talk in meeting a payroll and, and facing the, the consequences of being in business. I fear that many of my colleagues do not realize the extent to which the higher tax rates in the budget reconciliation plan will hit small business and, and this is the important thing, destroy job creation. My amendment will permit a debate and a vote on this important issue. The Treasury Department data shows that 62 percent of those impacted by the higher tax brackets report small business or farm income on IRS Schedule C, E, or F. The importance of this amendment is demonstrated by information relayed to me recently by the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Business. From 1988 to 1990, 4.1 million new jobs were created by small business. During that same period, businesses with over 500 employees had a net loss of jobs. I ask you, who is going to create the new jobs in this country if Congress increases the marginal tax rate on small business by over a third. And it's truly, in my judgment, an insane policy, and I believe that the House of Representatives should have the opportunity to debate and offer alternatives. I have requested in writing a revenue estimate from the Joint Tax Committee. The amendment is limited to small business with annual receipts of $5 million or less per year. And in this way, this will limit any revenue loss which would be estimated under a static revenue model. However, I must emphasize to you that my belief in this amendment is that it will save hundreds of thousands of jobs that will be destroyed if the tax plan is approved unamended. Any revenue estimate that fails to factor in the negative impact of higher taxes on job creation is invalid in the real world and constitutes nothing more than fantasies of academics. I am confident in the real world my amendment will not reduce revenue. In fact, it may even save the government revenue that it is about to lose from one of the most anti-job programs in the history of this country. Just let me quote from one small business person in the real world whose letter was read on the, into rather, the congressional record on Monday. The proposal to increase the top rate from 31 percent to 36 percent with an additional 10 percent surtax on our taxable income exceeding a quarter of a million dollars has caused us to defer most of our previously planned expansions for 1993 and 1994. Now, I recognize that the Congressional Revenue Estimating process fails to acknowledge these basic changes in behavior resulting from higher taxes. People don't always behave the way you want them to. Therefore, in order to offset any revenue loss that may be estimated under a static model, I have included in my amendment $25 billion in budget savings over five years. I think you have that paperwork. These savings come from items such as elimination of the Interstate Commerce Commission, repeal of Davis-Bacon, a 15 percent cut in the congressional budget, privatization of the federal helium reserves, and numerous other items. As I mentioned, I requested a revenue estimate from the Joint Tax Committee. However, since I have not as yet been given an estimate, I request that Sections 310D, David, and 311A of the Budget Act of 1974 requiring budget neutrality be waived in the rule. I've also been advised by the parliamentarian that this amendment 
requires a waiver of Rule 21, Sections 5A and 5B. The American people have spoken loud and clear on budge budget reconciliation. They want fewer tax increases and more budget cuts. And I honestly believe job creation will suffer tremendously if we don't freeze the taxes at the current level. I hope you will allow my amendment to be offered on the floor tomorrow. I thank you very much for listening and I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you today. Thank you. No, Joe, I just want to thank you for coming before us. Uh, you know, small businesses uh, create 75% of all the new jobs in America every single year. And uh, uh, with the uh, unemployment rates stagnated uh, due to lack of consumer confidence, uh, uh, certainly this would do a, go a long way if we could enact this into the legislation. Uh, I think the approval of this legislation, which is going down every day, would, uh, would go up a little bit. So uh, certainly uh, we'd like to make your amendment in order. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Let me say that uh, you and I, Joe, have discussed your amendment on the floor just a few minutes ago, and it seems to me that since you are trying to hone in on that very important segment of the economy to which Jerry referred, uh, this is a very, very appropriate item. You come from the front line as a small business person yourself, and uh, so I appreciate your being here to offer the amendment, and we'll do everything we possibly can to make it in order. In fact, I will tell you that I plan to personally offer your amendment when we begin marking up this rule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, appreciate that very, very much. Mr. Goss? Madam Chairwoman, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add one more dimension and, and say that uh, I think that part of this exercise that we've gone through today and much of the testimony has gone to the underlying need we all know about to create jobs and strengthen our economy. And I uh, don't believe that the uh, administration's package, as it is uh, outlined right now, will do much to enhance jobs for small business. Uh, I'm afraid that the incentives run the other way and we may lose some jobs. And I wonder if in your research you have any view on whether or not your amendment would add or, uh, or not add uh, the opportunity for jobs in America. My view is that it would, any time that you allow business, if you minimize the tax on a business, you're going to increase the potentiality for expansion. Right now, as I mentioned, the letter I just read, which is significant, I think, of what most business owners feel right now is that if they are taxed in addition to what they currently pay, they will forego any kind of hiring. They'll forego putting people into tax-paying positions and rather uh, maybe foreclose on them and cause them to be tax spenders by being unemployed. I do have some, uh, a figure, uh, Mr. Goss, that might be or an interesting uh, comment regarding the uh, question you raised. Uh, and this is an assumption that may speak to what you're driving at. If we look at the, the um, estimate that the Treasury Department is correct in this assessment, that 300, small, 300,000 small businesses will be affected by this higher individual tax rate in the budget reconciliation plan. If we assume further that the average business, using those guides at 5 million limit, that they're, they're um, uh, they will make on an average about $290,000 a year. The five-year static revenue loss would be approximately $14.1 billion, which is far less than what my budget cuts come up to, which are something in the neighborhood of $25 billion. So do I think it's, if we freeze it at the per current level, that we will help job creation? Absolutely. And that's the whole purpose of the amendment, is to ensure that we will build more jobs, create more jobs, and get business, small business in particular. Well, I think your amendment certainly deserves debate. Uh, it has merit, I think, and certainly uh, whether the conclusion of the majority is it should be adopted or not, uh, it's at least we should have that opportunity. And I would hope that before we have the opportunity for that vote, you might be able to give us a, just a few more specifics on that, because I think it's a very relevant question. I do believe there's a lot of jobs at stake. A good deal of what drives our economy is small business in this country, and it's very sensitive to these types of regulations. We, uh, we do things here in the abstract that have Im implications and impacts that we find about after the fact, uh, and find out they're always not as good ideas as we thought they are. Just uh, some statistics we've received on the energy tax today alone uh, indicate that your state, Michigan, is going to have a job loss of almost 16,000 uh, jobs on the energy tax question alone. And uh, if we can start finding ways to get some of those back, uh, if that energy tax should actually survive, uh, I think that's the kind of information that would be helpful to your case. 
we can supply you, in fact, with any additional information you might need. But that exactly illustrates the point of what I'm talking about. Exactly. That job loss sustained by the impact of the energy tax tells a story. In my district, it's about 1,600 jobs that would be lost by virtue of the... Well, I'm sorry to hear that, because when you multiply that 1,600 times the multiplier of four or five, which is the family ripple effect on it, it adds up to a lot of pain and suffering. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, ladies and Thank gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rules Committee. I appreciate the, this opportunity. Indeed. Thank you very much. Our next witness is William Ford. Madam Chairman and members of the committee, uh, on May the 12th, in response to instructions contained in the conference report on House Concurrent Resolution 64, the Fiscal 1994 Budget Resolution, the Committee on Education and Labor reported recommendations that, according to the House Budget Committee, complied fully with our instruction to report savings of $5.8 billion over the next five years. Our recommendations embraced both President Clinton's proposals and explicit assumptions underlying your reconciliation instructions. I understand that the committee is uh, going to be or has been requested to consider alternative um, methods for uh, reducing the cost of the student loan program to that which was adopted by the uh, Education and Labor Committee. I'd just like to say to you briefly that the student loan reform legislation recommended by the Committee on Education and Labor is a result of very careful study and a good deal of debate over several years. And it's been studied by CBO, GAO, CRS, OMB, the Department of Education, and other public and private organizations. During the committee's deliberations on the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act last year, direct loans were discussed by 24 witnesses in 13 different hearings in Washington and around the nation. The committee's recommendation is based on the Reauthorization Act it approved last year. That report contained a phased-in direct loan program similar to the committee's reconciliation report. I would ask unanimous consent to include the rest of my statement in the record Without and submit the question. Any questions, Mr. Goss? Not at all. Thank you. We're very clear. I would just simply ask that, that you resist the, the uh, request for amendments. This gets very technical when you try to discuss it mm -hmm. in any forum, but the floor of the House is no place to discuss it, very frankly, because uh, people tend to make a lot of assumptions about how the present program works, how the new program would work, and uh, the most frequently uh, well thought out uh, assumptions, but based on uh, something less than the facts, it could turn into uh, a major uh, battle on the floor that would produce nothing if we had amendments to the, these education sections. And I would ask the committee, in the interest of passing the entire package, to avoid that for us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, may I just want to make sure I clear. You want a closed rule on your section. Is that a correct? On my section, yes. Thank you very much. It's the first time I've ever come to you and asked for a closed rule, by the way. So I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. The Honorable Susan Molinari is next. I see she's not here. Gerald Nadler. Accompanied by... Uh, I, I think Carol Maloney, are you? You oh, are. Yes. Okay. And, and Mr. Sanders, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. Madam Chairwoman, uh, distinguished members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am here to request the adoption of a rule that will permit me, on to, that will permit me along with uh, 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 Representative Maloney, to introduce an amendment to the reconciliation bill that would permit a reduction by almost half of the increase in taxation of Social Security benefits proposed by the President and by the Committee on Ways and Means. That reduction would be paid for and, and, and let me say, I've heard uh, some of the, our friends from the other side of the aisle uh, a little earlier. I didn't hear all their testimony, but I heard them proposing mm -hmm. to eliminate this. I, I didn't catch how they proposed to pay for it. This amendment proposes the exact ways to pay for 
uh, eliminate for what it would do. It would permit a reduction by almost half of the increase in taxation of Social Security benefits. That reduction would be paid for under this amendment by increasing the top corporate income tax rate on profits over $10 million. So we're not talking here about small businesses. Increasing the top corporate income tax rate on profits over $10 million to 36% as proposed by the President instead of the 35% level set by the Ways and Means Committee. This 1% change would permit reduction of the Social Security tax increase by almost half. I am joined in my request by 14 other members of the House, all of whom have signed the letter I submitted yesterday to the Chairman and Ranking Member of this Committee. Uh, Madam Chairperson, many members of the House, as I am sure you know, have felt great concern about the level of sacrifice requested of senior citizens in the President's five-year economic plan. Although the plan is in large measure guided by the simple, widely accepted principle that the greatest burden should be borne by those most able to pay, the burden placed on seniors in the plan stands out as a conspicuous exception to that rule. As you know, in the 1980s, Congress and the President made 50% of the Social Security benefits of the quote-unquote wealthiest recipients subject to the income tax. The wealthy, in quotes, were defined for this purpose as individuals with incomes in excess of $25,000 and couples with incomes in excess of $32,000, including in both cases half of Social Security benefits uh, to meet this threshold. Since those figures were not indexed for inflation, the people subject to taxation of their benefits are becoming a less wealthy group every year. I might note here that uh, since the mid-80s, um, tax, uh, tax brackets have been indexed for inflation, but not these threshold definitions of what wealthy Social Security recipients are who are subject to taxation of their Social Security benefits. And therefore, um, uh, individuals who in real terms are, are of more and more modest means each year are subject to Social Security taxation. The proposal approved by Ways and Means would increase to 85 percent the proportion of those same recipients' benefits subject to the income tax. The result would be an income tax paid by senior citizens, unlike that paid by anyone else of like income. Let us take the example of a 70-year-old couple that has planned fairly well for retirement and in addition to $15,000 in Social Security benefits, has $40,000 in taxable income. Under the plan adopted by Ways and Means, that couple would pay an additional $1,048 in federal income tax next year, along with whatever its share of the new BTU tax would amount to, an estimated $150 to $200 per household. By contrast, the 40-year-old couple next door with the identical income would pay the energy tax increase, but no additional income tax. It is hard to defend a result like this as fair or as requesting equal sacrifice of all citizens in accordance with their means. Again, this couple with, with $40,000 in taxable income and $15,000 in Social Security would pay, in addition to the BTU tax, an increase in taxes only because of their Social Security status of $1,048 that a 45-year-old couple with identical income would not pay. Nobody else in this country, Madam Chairperson, would pay a similar increase under the, in, the pre, in this proposal until they're in the $180,000 or $190,000 income range. Chair, are you, are you saying that if they had $40,000 income outside the Social Security, $15,000 Social Security? They will pay you, a $1,000. The tax is only on the Social Security portion. No, the, the increase in taxes on the Social Security portion would amount to $1,048. On a $15,000 income? Yes, that is exactly right. It doesn't sound right. That's well, it doesn't sound right, rate. but check with ways and means because it works out no, to that. I, okay. Check with ways and means, that's exactly the way it works out. Um, the, the increase is startling. Um, and frankly, I chose this income level because it is so startling. At, at different income levels, it's less startling. Uh, at higher income levels, it's more startling. But someone making $55,000, if they're 45 years old, the sole increase in taxes they'll pay would be, uh, would be the, the BTU tax estimated to be between $150 and $200, depending on how, much, on how much they drive their car and so forth. But the same couple, make them 75 years old, and make 15000 of that income, Social Security, and the rest, 40000 taxable income, will pay a $1,048 increase. And you can look, and we derive this right out of the uh, charts. 
Hmm? At a 28% rate. Yeah, in fact, I think it's a little lower rate. I think it was 24. But, but we got this right out of the charts. Check it. That's exactly what we're talking about. And nobody else uh, would pay this kind of increase until you're talking about the $180,000, $190,000 bracket. When the Ma Ways and Means Committee decided to drop the President's proposed investment tax credit for a saving of $30.4 billion, many members viewed that as a golden opportunity to eliminate the proposed $32 billion increase in taxation on Social Security benefits. The Ways and Means Committee thought otherwise, however, and made other cuts with that $30 billion saving. Most notably, the committee dropped the 36% top corporate income tax rate proposed by the President all the way down 1% to 35%. The members who have joined in offering this amendment believe that that was a mistake. The 36% rate proposed by the President up from the present 34% is still relatively low in historical terms. We believe the saving provided by elimination of the investment tax credit should have been used to replace the unfair income tax increase for which senior citizens have been targeted. This amendment that I am offering and for which I ask, and which I ask that you uh, make uh, in order represents a compromise that would permit elimination of almost half of the increased tax on Social Security benefits by adopting the 36% top rate on corporate profits recommended by the President. I believe that this amendment would produce a reconciliation bill more reflective of the priorities of a majority of the members of this House, and I strongly urge the members of the Rules Committee to adopt the rule that permits consideration of that amendment when the House acts on reconciliation. In addition, I have offered a second amendment that goes further, eliminating the entire increase in taxation of Social Security benefits by combining the same increase in the top corporate income tax rate to 36%, with $17.2 billion in reductions in the military budget over five years. The reductions specified are cancellation of the AX aircraft, the feeling being that with the reduction of, the, with the elimination, I should say, of the Soviet Union's uh, research program uh, to bring in a new generation of, uh, of uh, top of the line aircraft, the FA 18 Hornet would do very well for the next decade, and we don't need another aircraft to replace it. The scaling back of SDI research to focus on theater defense with a similar rationale with the elimination of the Soviet Union is no excuse anymore to waste a lot of money on Star Wars. We do need arguably theater defense against SCUDs or their progeny, but we can do that uh, with a lesser budget. Termination of production of the D-5 submarine launched ballistic missile. We have 656 uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles and again uh, with, the, with the elimination of the Soviet Union as a as a, as a, as with the elimination of the necessity for deterring the no longer existing Soviet Union from a massive nuclear attack, 656 submarine launched ballistic missiles seems ample, more than ample to handle any other threat around the world. We don't need more D-5 Trident missiles. And a scaling back of the Department of Energy's production and maintenance activities of nuclear weapons to support an arsenal of only, in quotes, 4,000 nuclear warheads, which should be sufficient, more than sufficient to terrorize the rest of the world. I believe all of these changes can be made without any reduction in, in our nation's safety in the post-Cold War world. Accordingly, I urge adoption of a rule that would permit consideration of the floor of, on the floor of the Second Amendment and would waive any points of order. And again, if you can't see your way clear to allowing this amendment, then at least uh, make in order, please, the First Amendment to cut the Social Security uh, 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 tax increase almost in half uh, without touching the military budget and paying for it only by restoring the corporate tax rate on profits over $10 million to 36% as, as the President recommended instead of 35% as proposed by Ways and Means. And I thank you for your time and consideration. You're welcome. Ms. Maloney? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm here today to urge the Rules Committee to allow Congressman Nadler, myself, and several other freshmen to offer amendments to the Reconciliation Bill. I am grateful to have this opportunity to express the concern of thousands of my constituents who are senior citizens and who are very upset about a provision in the Reconciliation Bill which would increase the Social Security income tax inclusion from 50 to 85 percent for seniors earning as little as 25000 a year. This provision, which I believe we should eliminate from the bill, discriminates against seniors and provides a needless disincentive for seniors to work. Above all, it will adversely affect Social Security recipients with very modest income levels while letting far wealthier Americans off the hook. 
When compared to a proposed increase in income taxes on other Americans, it is painfully clear the tax on seniors' Social Security benefits kick in at a much lower income threshold. For example, once individual Social Security recipients outside incomes exceed 25000 they pay more in taxes on their Social Security benefits. But it is not until the 140000 income threshold that taxes on non-seniors' incomes go up. Where is the fairness in this proposal? In many parts of the country, including New York City, Income levels of 25,000 barely provide subsistence, especially for seniors with medical problems. Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, I strongly support dropping this provision altogether by raising the top corporate income tax rate to 36% and raising 17.2 billion by making additional spending cuts to the military budget over the next five years. As a compromise, I would also support a second amendment we are offering that would reduce the inclusion from 85% to 69%. At the very least, this amendment would lessen by half the impact of this provision on our senior citizens. I strongly urge you to allow this modified rule so we can continue our fight on behalf of senior citizens tomorrow on the House floor. Whether we succeed or fail, we deserve the right to try. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mr. Sanders? Sure. my strong support for the amendments being brought forth uh, by Mr. Nadler. Under the President's program, the good news is that 75 percent of the new taxes will be paid by the top 6 percent of taxpayers, and I think that that is exactly appropriate. Unfortunately, and I think not being a Democrat or a Republican, not wanting to give advice to the Democrats, but I think the uh, President made a terrible tactical error of which our Republican friends are being very successful in, in, in making the right points. And that is, no matter how you slice it, the BTU tax is a regressive tax. It's an unfair tax, and as we've just heard from previous spokespersons, as well as um, people right here on the panel with me, uh, it is unfair, and it is regressive to hit senior citizens with what will amount to be a very uh, significant increase in their tax burden. Um, Uh, the previous speakers have already talked about the significant increase in taxes that would hit many senior citizens, so it's not uh, necessary for me to, to make the point again. Uh, the basic point that I would make, and where I think the President is making an awful mistake, is it is not true, as some of the previous speakers and uh, Republicans have made, is that the people of America are saying, no more taxes, no more taxes. I don't believe that. I think that what the people of America understand very well is that one of the reasons we have a $4 trillion debt and a $260 billion deficit is that under Reaganomics we gave huge tax breaks to the very richest people in this country at the same time as their income soared. So the rich got richer, paid less in taxes, middle income people, working people became poorer and paid more in taxes. I think no serious economist believes that we can deal with the deficit in an intelligent way, in an irrational way, if in fact we don't raise taxes. That's what we've got to do. So the question is who should pay those taxes? Should it be senior citizens who make $25,000 a year? Are they really wealthy? Should it be working people in the state of Vermont who have to drive long distances to work? Should they be asked to pay more in gasoline taxes? I think not. So I think that uh, the uh, amendment brought forth by Mr. Nadler moves directly in the right direction. I think it will take out one of the elements, one of the regressive aspects of the tax proposal, and I would very uh, much hope uh, that it be allowed to uh, be debated on the floor of the House. Thank you. Mr. Simon? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, a lot of the testimony uh, was uh, of interest, and, uh, and I am, am somewhat supportive of some of it. Uh, first of all, I will just tell my friend from Vermont that he should have voted for the Solomon budget, because what the Solomon budget did, if you recall, it removed the BTU tax entirely, it removed the Social Security tax entirely, it left in the millionaire's tax, it left in a uh, new bracket of tax on incomes over $200,000. Uh, and a series of other taxes, and that was uh, that would have made uh, us taxing that top top six percent even more, and wiping out the total tax on middle class America. Uh, the general yield. I don't, I don't want my friend from no, to feel I badly. I didn't point. vote for that budget either. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How many votes did they get? Huh? Well, you'd be surprised how many it's going to get over in the Senate because they're yeah. going to adopt it. <laughs> uh, but uh, and needless to say, uh, the request on the uh, on the defense budget. Uh, 
I would have to oppose uh, our young uh, men and women serving in the military today. They are the sons and daughters of your constituents and mine. Uh, in a very few years, they are going to be overstretched, under-equipped, and demoralized by what we are doing to the defense budget. But let's get to, the, <coughs> to your other proposal, <clears throat> because there you want to wipe out half of the uh, Social Security tax. And, well, 16% uh, of the 35% increase, about 45%. Right. Yeah. Which, uh, which makes a lot of sense. The only problem is when you, when you want to raise the corporate uh, tax rate, you have to keep in mind, and I made a little speech, some of you were sitting here, about those of us that have saved all of our lives, and uh, now we have a little bit of stock in the bank. And those same people that you're trying to cut the tax in half on that have incomes of $25,000 for a single, $32,000 for a couple, where do you think they get that income to put them in that tax bracket? It's the Social Security check, and it's the income derived from the uh, dividends from the stocks they hold in those companies with incomes over $10 million a year. So you're sort of taking it out of one pocket and giving it back to them in the other pocket. So there's nothing gained. Just a minute. Now, you had a, a man by the name of uh, Bastler, Scotty Bastler, a new Democrat freshman from uh, Kentucky. And he came in here and he made a lot of sense because um, he wanted to repeal the BTU tax. And, but he took a lot of the recommendations that I have. That's such why it as, made a lot of sense. That's right. Took a lot of recommendations. Exactly. <laughs> but now, just for instance, if you would take out that, uh, that increase on the corporate uh, income tax over, over uh, $10 million, uh, and you would replace it with, with items that, like he has, and let me just read them to you, eliminating the uh, EITC, that's your earned income uh, tax uh, credit, uh, expansion, uh, canceling the superconducting super collider, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, canceling the space station freedom, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, canceling NASA's development program for the advanced solid rocket motor, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you could almost pick up the same income, and if you did that, you'd pick up my support, and I'd be voting for you on the floor on your amendment, because your amendment really makes a lot of sense, except that uh, you're really robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, with that, so I just point that out to you. But, uh, well, let me, let me, let me, if I, if I may, you. if I may, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Solomon. Let me say it's a, it's a great pleasure to engage in dialogue with you again after uh, what 16, All these years? <laughs> 14 years we last engaged in dialogue on the floor of the New York State Assembly. Um, first, let me let me comment on a, a couple of comments you made on, on my proposal, and then uh, let me comment on yours. Um, first of all, I don't. Uh, it is true, of course, that many senior citizens, as well as many others, own stock in, in major companies, and that's where they get, uh, uh, or, and small companies, too. And let me be very clear, we're not talking here about small businesses. Small businesses don't have after-tax profits of $10 million a year. So we're talking about uh, large businesses, and obviously a lot of uh, senior citizens own stock in that. But obviously, so do a lot of non-senior citizens, a lot of insurance companies, a lot of foreigners, a lot of everybody else in the world. A lot of union pension funds. A lot of everybody else in the world, union pension funds, whatever. So to say that we're by, by transferring uh, $16 uh, billion dollars in effect, uh, yeah, $16 billion it seems to come to about $1 billion per percent. <laughs> about $16 billion from, uh, from the senior citizen, from the, from the backs of the senior citizens in taxes to the large corporations, we're just taking it from one po pocket to another. That's true to a very minor point, because obviously that $16 billion if taxed from the corporations, uh, a very small fraction of that will come from the senior citizens who are getting the money back in terms of less taxation on Social Security. A lot of it will come from everybody else in the world who owns stock. Um, second of all, uh, let me say that I believe that, as I said before, uh, his in, in historical terms, uh, and by historical I'm talking about the last 50 years or 30 years, 36% um, is a very small a top racket for corporate income taxes, it was 50, 46% and 50% and at times higher than that. Um, and I don't think that the 1% difference from what Ways and Means is recommended to here is going to make um, very much economic difference uh, at all. Um, secondly, I would, um, I framed this amendment, frankly, um, because the way I did, because I kept being told that uh, under the rules you cannot uh, uh, translate um, um, uh, a reduction in the proposed tax vis-a-vis uh, -vis a reduction in expenditure, and that's why on the other amendment I asked for a, uh, I asked for a waiver of, of, of points of order uh, because I'm not sure exactly what points of order there could be. Uh, I would be very amenable, um, certainly, to amending my amendment. I don't know what the rules of the Rules Committee are, uh, to 
if we can do reductions in expenditures uh, here, uh, I would very, be very amenable to every reduction you mentioned except for one. What was the first one you earned mentioned? Income earned, income earned income tax credit. That was the one I couldn't. Frankly, the space station by itself is $10.4 billion. Right. Uh, the reduct my first amendment could be financed entirely by the, re probably by everything, by the reduction in the space station, the ASRM, and a few others. So I would be amenable to C the C-17. I'd be amenable, and by the way, let me, let me comment on that too. I'm glad <laughs> Carolyn reminded me. I didn't mention the C-17. I don't think it's accurate or germane, frankly, to talk about, uh, as was talked about on the floor today, uh, to talk about... Uh, hey, what's the oh, I'm sorry, I was wondering what happened. Um, I don't think it's accurate or germane to talk about uh, our sons and daughters or those of our constituents uh, going off to serve with inadequate training and inadequate uh, weapons and uh, so forth if we're talking about very specific cuts in the military budget and if those cuts are not such are not such those such as to do that. Now the cuts I uh, specifically proposed would have no impact on training, no impact on weaponry that our forces are going to use, and frankly I don't think any impact whatsoever on our defense posture. And let's go through them very briefly. Um, I'm proposing that we limit the nuclear arsenal to 4,000 warheads. Again, as I said on the floor today in debate on a different amendment, the defense department is being, the defense budget is being cut by the, by, in the reconciliation bill uh, and in the, uh, in the president's program. But I don't think the, that what we are doing really reflects the sea change that has occurred. It frankly does reflect the debate that occurred between, uh, uh, I would say, the bulk of the Democratic Party, although not all, and perhaps the bulk of the Republican Party, during the 1980s. Uh, when many of us thought that President Reagan and President Bush had a bloated defense budget, many other people thought they didn't. But that was in the context of the Soviet threat being there and existing. And the question was, how much did we have to spend uh, given that threat? That threat no longer exists. And frankly, the cuts that now uh, are being made don't reflect that fact. They reflect pretty much the Democratic position on the earlier debate. But now that threat doesn't exist. 4,000 nuclear weapons is sufficient to terrorize everybody in the world. We no longer have to worry about, first, uh, about second strike capability to absorb a first strike from the Soviet Union and still have enough to hit back and so forth, which was the justification for a lot of this. So we don't need to worry about that. Uh, termination of production of the D-5 submarine launched missile. We have 656, if I remember my, my arithmetic correctly, submarine launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs. The, again, that's enough to destroy the world several times over. We don't have to worry uh, that our Trident and uh, uh, submarine fleet is going to be uh, hijacked by Soviet uh, killer uh, submarines that aren't prowling the seas anymore. Um, so I don't know why we need more D-5s. Mr. Mr. Natter, let me, uh, with all due respect... We don't, I, I, let, me, let me just say, well, I, I think I've made the point. Yeah, it's, it, uh, we, we don't have to worry about these things. And you were being repetitive of I'm what sorry. you said before. Which, I'm sorry. Uh, let, me, let me just say this, you know, the, we have had, uh, we've been here now for going on eight hours listening to testimony from a lot of members, Democrats and Republicans. And independents. Uh, there are 15... And independents. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to yield to you, Bernie. No, just just there are, <laughs> there have been about a 15 uh, amendments by Republicans that are not duplicative. There have been 29 altogether, but 15 that we can sort out as being different. There have been seven or eight Democrat amendments, such as yours, uh, and you deserve the right to go on the floor and debate that amendment, uh, whichever one you choose. Maybe not both, but... Uh, I'll leave that to the committee, either but, one. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid you're not going to get that opportunity, but you really should. Now, if you're talking 15 uh, Republican amendments, seven or eight Democrat amendments, and uh, even boiling it down to, to eight each, it wouldn't take us two days to debate those issues on the floor. And whether it's the BTU, the Social Security, whether it's the defense budget, Everybody would have their, their time to, to work their will on the floor of Congress. And we really should, the American people deserve that. And uh, I, for one, uh, would be offering an amendment if we defeat the rule on the floor uh, to come back and allow just that and nothing more. Mr. Stenholm over there with an amendment, Mr. Slattery, whoever it might be, uh, and give them their day in court. It isn't going to take that long, and at least the Congress would have worked its will. You have 80 more members on the Democrat side than we have on the Republican <coughs> side. You probably can work your will pretty much the way you want it, but uh, uh, you'd be surprised. You'd probably win. If you got the right to go on the floor, you'd win. Oh, I think we would. I think we would. And, uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. I yield to my friend from Vermont. 
Thank who you. shares a border about 100 miles long with me. Yeah. I met some UAW workers the other day. We're talking right. about you. But I defended you despite <laughs> what they said, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me make you tell this. Tell I was a friend of Charlie Stenholz? <laughs> let, let me make this suggestion. Mr. Muckley, it, it seems to me that the Republicans have been quite successful uh, in their attempts to attack this program. And I think it is good politics from your point of view, if you allow me being the independent to give you some advice here. I think if we can, it doesn't matter whether it's totally uh, Nadler's amendment or totally somebody else's amendment. If you can give, you can be helping the president. If we can develop a more progressive way to get rid of this bad progressive social security tax, it's going to be a good thing for the president. I think Mr. Nadler mentioned a number of military programs. Mr. Solomon mentioned the super collider, I believe, the space station. I'm in agreement with that. And maybe what you want to do, I don't happen to agree, by the way, that we should be looking at 16 different amendments. I think really what your job is to try to filter these things out. Give us some. But I think if you can put together an amendment which in a progress, progressive way gets rid of the regressive aspects of the president's proposal, and as I mentioned earlier, three quarters of his proposal is progressive. That's the good news. You only have 25% of the way to go. And if you can target specific military programs that are obsolete, unneeded, programs like the Super Collider, the Space Station, nuclear weapons that we really don't need, nuclear bombs that we don't need, I think you're going to have a winner. And I think not only can we carry it on the floor of the House, I think the President will be very grateful because I think we can generate a lot more support for that. So what I'm begging of you, and I think you have a better chance to win this, I'm in doubt how to vote tomorrow. I support the President. I don't want to see the President fail. I'm not a Republican. But I do think that he's made a mistake by coming up with regressive aspects of this program. So I think you'll be serving the president well and many of us well if you get rid of the regressive aspects and give us a more progressive and fair program to which we can support tomorrow. Thank you, and I yield back the uh, balance of my time. <laughs> Everybody testify? No. Mr. Qu uh, did you testify? Yes. Okay. Mr. Quillen? I'm late, but I'm glad to see the pairs at the table testifying because I think your testimony all combined will help expedite the hearings of this committee. If we go to the floor tomorrow with eight hours of discussion here in this committee, and we're going to be here for 24 straight hours. So I appreciate your all expediting it. appreciate your testimony, that part which I heard. But uh, anyway, I think this is a good way to do it in pairs of three. Pairs of three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. And we're all glad to know that Mr. Quillen is in such great physical condition now that he'll be able to charge through those 24 hours. Uh, you all have obviously uh, established this very important New York Vermont nexus with Mr. Solomon, so there's nothing I could add to it. Congratulations <laughs> for your effort. <laughs> Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think something very useful has come out of this. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I understood the number properly um, that the scenario you gave us, that the, the impact on your um, hypothetical case or your sample, as it were, senior citizen, was $1,048 per year. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, at that income level. If $15,000 was Social Security income and $40,000 was other income, Right. Then the impact of this change from 50 percent to 85 percent Social Security uh, being taxed would be $1,048, which, as I pointed out, is far in excess of, of the tax increase of the same $55,000 a year couple if they were under 65 and their income were not from Social Security, and disproportionate. The only other people who will be paying uh, this kind of a tax increase would be in the $180,000, $190,000 bracket. On the, uh, on, on, the, on the top bracket increase. And the, uh, the way you're going to do this, you talked about the reduction uh, to about half. What is about half? Is that 69%? 69%. Percent. 69% instead of 85%. Okay. That and and we re arrived at that number because that's exactly the amount that we financed by going back to 36% of the. Uh, okay, I, that, well, that was what motivated you to do that. Which I, yes. I, I wondered how you achieved uh, just that just, particular number. Just dollar for dollar. I, uh, I would describe the, uh, the gentlelady from New York's uh, response to your testimony as being somewhat astonished uh, at that number. I don't think that she'd heard that number before. 
Slaughter. I'm talking about Ms. Slaughter. When, yeah, well, when she was we here. hadn't heard that number. What we started doing in my office uh, was playing with numbers. We got the definition from uh, uh, CRS or from CBO of exactly how this would work. And we started playing with numbers at different income levels. And then we had this confirmed by, by CBO and by CRS. This is the impact. And there's an impact that is so far in excess and so disproportionate to what anybody under the age of 65 will, will have that I, I suspect it's an unanticipated event that I, I wonder if they did the arithmetic. Well, that's exactly my point. This, this, when you start raising taxes, you always have un, unanticipated consequences. And I, uh, I know we've already got a lot of people on uh, fixed income situations, some in this level, and it describes a lot of folks down where I live, in fact, uh, and many other uh, areas. And uh, I know that that would be a tremendous shock. They are not expecting uh, a bite of that magnitude if this thing goes through. So I think that this testimony today has been extremely valuable, and I think that your amendment is also. I did want to offer one suggestion to you. There have been a lot of numbers thrown out. And the, the impact number that we have uh, on the impact of the uh, energy tax is a lot different than the number you're using. Uh, the number that we have, and I guess uh, this was uh, not disputed would be the way to put it, by the uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, was that it would be on, a, on the uh, average American family, it would be a, between a four and a five hundred dollar hit. You've used the word uh, a hundred to two hundred. One fifty to two hundred. Yeah, that is per, per individual. Uh, th that seems to be uh, the range on a per household basis. Oh, happily. I, I think we have it that's per household. Excuse me? I think we have it in our papers as per household. Uh, well, uh, you, again, this is. Okay. Uh, I would suggest that's wrong, Mr. Chairman, respectfully, of course. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, maybe now, may, maybe now is the time for me to ask that we put it into the committee records, these, uh, these statistics uh, that we have that uh, do hypotheticals on the uh, impact of the Clinton energy tax uh, to, on American families. Uh, and, the, and the range of the samples that they give us are $420 uh, up to $544. That's a two-person family or a six-person family. Well, all, all I can say, sir, is that uh, the information, uh, the figures, rather, that I was using we got from, from uh, uh, the information put out by the administration. Unlike the, the, the figures on Social Security, we didn't start studying them. So I, I don't... Uh, I don't I, I hope that the I hope my figures are correct and not the ones you're giving, but I don't know. Let me put it this way. I don't think anybody really knows what it's going to be any more than they know exactly what the average American family is. So let's be clear. It's going to be a couple of hundred dollars one way or the other. But uh, I think that, that that underscores the point that I'm making here. When you go out to raise taxes, you create uncertainties uh, about what the impacts and consequences are going to be. When you start making cuts, you get a little bit more finite results. And I commend you for the way that uh, you have uh, uh, addressed the concerns of our senior citizens, because I share those concerns. Uh, and I, I hope uh, that if we can get your amendment on the floor, that you'll listen with the same attention to the amendment we hope to get on the floor, uh, urging that we cut the, senior, the tax on seniors uh, and we pay for it by cuts rather than additional taxes on business. Well, as I, as I stated before, um I certainly would be very amenable to uh, paying for it by cuts if they were cuts in the right things. And of the cuts mentioned by Mr. Solomon, the only one that I would not support would be the, the earned income uh, tax credit. Well, I, I think that that's the subject of great debate and the proper place is on the floor. Let's hope we get those amendments there. Thank you very much. Very Mr. useful. Mr. Goss, getting back to our dispute on figures, a special report from uh, its revised energy tax proposal. Uh, it says the Ways and Means Committee estimates that the tax would raise the average annual en energy expenditures for a family of four earning $40,000 a year by $110. Okay. Hence, the energy proposal accounts for the, only the additional t a direct tax burden that would be shouldered by the middle class Americans under Clinton's economic plan. The impact, impact on the tax on low income families would be offset in part by an in in earned income tax credit approved by the Committee for the Working Poor. Does that include the uh, heating oil, the air conditioning oil, or is that just the transportation tax? No, this just says the, uh, the energy, the, the yeah. treasury fully. It's, I believe that's just energy part of it. I think when you add in the rest of the ingredients, uh, Mr. Chairman, you get that number goes up a little bit, because I see that number here in that range as uh, listed under gasoline for vehicles in my uh, charts. And I'm not saying that my, answer, my figures are right. right. 
I'm not saying my figures are right. I'm just I saying. Know, I know I saw the figures someplace. I, I accept your explanation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Mr. You Chairman. Coming. The next panel will be the Honorable Larry LaRocca, uh, Mr. Stenholm, and Mr. Slattery. And Mr. Orton. And Mr. Orton. Quentin, if you was impressed with three team, then uh, we're going to quadruple yeah, you on this one. That's even better. Can you bring some more? We got Mr. Penny on the way. Okay. Right. Radio interview in five minutes. You'll make it. Do it from here. Gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come before this committee uh, this evening to request that uh, our amendment uh, be made in order when we consider the budget reconciliation bill tomorrow. Days after President Clinton was sworn in as president on these Capitol steps, he offered oh, a sure. State of the Union address. Me, uh, Your amendment is up here, isn't it? We have the amendment. Supposed to. Do you have it? We do. I don't have it, and that's why I will. I've been here sitting here for eight hours, and I don't deserve a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. I would just like to have it. Is that the amendment there? Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Charlie. Surely. One of the promises our president made at that time was a commitment to reducing our enormous federal deficit. The budget which President Clinton proposed follow up that promise of deficit reduction with a concrete proposal. The budget resolution subsequently passed by the Congress established the game plan calling for $496 billion in deficit reduction over the next five years and bringing the deficit below $200 billion by fiscal year 1998. All through the Budget Committee deliberations of the budget resolution, which I proudly serve, I inquired about the proper time and the place to discuss budget enforcement procedures. <laughs> Repeatedly, I was told that the time was not now, but rather during reconciliation. Therefore, as part of the additional views to the committee report, which a number of Democrats and I signed, we stated clearly that when the reconciliation was considered, we would be promoting means of guaranteeing the deficit reduction we had just supported in the resolution. Come today with an amendment that seeks to do just that, guarantee the promises of our presidents and our own budget. It is imperative for both substantive and political reasons that we sign the contract ensuring that we will stay within the parameters of that budget. There have been a number of misunderstandings that must be clarified about what I am proposing. First, with this provision, there still would be an increase of $260 billion in entitlement program spending over the next five years, allowing for inflation demographic changes. I must say that I would prefer to do far better than that in the deficit reduction, and a number of my freshman colleagues in particular would prefer cuts to caps as well. I commend my colleagues Tim Penny and Alex McMillan for bringing amendments to this committee today proposing specific ways in which we can reduce entitlement spending immediately. I support the concept of these amendments and urge this committee to make them in order for floor consideration. But for those who worry that the current spending baseline will be lowered by my provision, it will not. Secondly, I'm talking about a cap on all entitlement programs. Some have demanded a concession that we include items such as farm subsidies and price supports in this cap. We gladly make such a concession because agriculture entitlements are part of this proposal and have been from the very beginning. Thirdly, one can make the commonly heard argument that this proposal would be detrimental to the poor and underprivileged only if one believes that the President and Congress budget is detrimental to the poor and underprivileged. We are enforcing the President's proposals and Congress's budget, not changing or detracting from them. I believe that everyone in this debate wants to ensure that the process does not go on autopilot. Some folks are concerned that spending cuts not go on autopilot with sequestration. Many others agree with me that entitlement spending should not remain on autopilot. I have agreed to a compromise of my original position, accepting that we can enforce a cap without sequestration. 
What I ask in my proposal is that the other side compromise and not try to insert loopholes into the process which would allow the caps to be automatically raised without any enacting legislation from Congress. The underlying premise of my proposal is accountability. Having enacted a package which guarantees deficit reduction, we must stand behind that promise. If there are legitimate reasons why we cannot hold to that promise, we should be honest about it and admit that we're not holding to it and have the opportunity to explain why. If we are honest with the public, they can decide, based on good information, whether or not they agree with our decisions. If we continue deceiving the public, promising that we will eliminate the deficit and then showing them deficit increases every year, they will continue to express a growing, if nonspecific, frustration with us. The only outcome I am seeking is to ensure that Congress and the President take concrete, real actions responding to unexpected entitlement spending growth. While my personal hope is that we will slow the growth of entitlement spending, that is not the outcome that I am seeking to guarantee with this particular proposal. The outcome I want to guarantee is that we take meaningful action one way or another which states what our position is towards entitlement spending which exceeds our expectations. Specifically, the amendment I seek to offer would build on the discretionary caps and pay-go procedures that will be included in the bill by adding a mechanism to control entitlement spending. My amendment would establish mandatory spending targets at the levels provided in the reconciliation bill before us. There would be no automatic adjustments to these spending targets. If entitlement spending was projected to exceed the cap, Congress and the President would be required to work together to enact legislation in response to the projected access. excess. If legislation either achieving savings to offset the excess or raising the targets was not enacted into law by October 1, the authority of the Treasury Department to borrow money to fund new programs would be suspended. I had hoped that we would be able to reach a general agreement on this concept, and I have a proposal included in the base bill or the rule allowing for the consideration of the reconciliation bill. I give a great deal of credit to our leadership for honestly trying to broker an agreement that all parties could accept. Unfortunately, time has run out on us, and despite agreement on the general concepts, we have not at this moment been able to work out the specific language to which all sides could agree. Thus, I am in the position of requesting consideration of this amendment on the House floor. I would appreciate the Chairman and the Committee's indulgence. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as luck would have it, I have a live radio interview in my district in one minute, and so I will be mercifully brief with you. Um, I come here in very strong support of the Stenholm Amendment. Uh, one thing is certain. We cannot balance our budget until we control entitlement spending. We have to start somewhere. That is clear. I applaud the President for his work on health care reform. We must get control of Medicare and Medicaid expenditures. This amendment seeks to do one simple thing. Tell the public that we will comply that we will stay within the caps that we've set in our budget over five years. And if we do not, we will have an enforcement mechanism, which I won't go through the, the processes of how it works, but we will have an enforcement mechanism which guarantees to the public that we will stay. They don't trust us. It didn't work in Graham-Rudman. It didn't work in the 1990 budget agreement. We're trying to come up with a mechanism that will. This mechanism follows the essential process which I laid out in a budget process reform bill which I've submitted to the Congress which I understand uh, original jurisdiction would lie with this committee and I would encourage this committee to also look at that general bill uh, reported out so that we could have real budget process and comprehensive budget process reform in the future. So with that, I will simply say I support this amendment and urge the committee to uh, find it in order to be uh, voted on on the floor. Thank yep. you. Mr. Slattery. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. It's, it's a pleasure to come here today and to lend my support to the request of my friend from Texas, Mr. Stenholm, and urging this committee to make an order, an amendment that would allow us to offer a cap on entitlements on the floor of the House. 
I do so with the firm conviction after six years on the Budget Committee that uh, we're not going to get our deficit problem under control until we get our entitlement spending under control. And I don't have to tell members of this committee that 48 percent of every dollar that the taxpayers of America send to Washington is spent on entitlement programs. And uh, the fact of the matter is, with the Clinton budget plan before us tomorrow, we are imposing a hard freeze on uh, the 37 percent of the budget that we call discretionary spending. We have never done that before. And if we're able to actually live within that hard freeze for five years, that will be a major achievement. And I think a lot of taxpayers, a lot of us in the Congress have argued for freezes in spending. We are doing that on the discretionary side of the budget. We are not doing that on the entitlement portion of the budget. And uh, as probably some of you know, the budget plan before us envisions that we will in fact be spending $250 billion more in entitlements over the next five years. $250 billion. Principally because of what's happening, of course, in, in Social Security, Medicare, particularly Medicaid, the other retirement programs, and the, old, the whole panoply of other entitlement programs. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we have got to get entitlements under control. And what uh, uh, Charlie Stenholm and uh, several of us have been working on is a, is a proposal that hopefully we can find 218 people to vote for that will move us in the direction of building into our budget process a very modest method of disciplining our spending habits on entitlements. And candidly, we all know that, that uh, n neither side of the political aisle has really demonstrated the stomach in the past to step up to this tough issue. And uh, we're sort of backing into it with this entitlement cap. We're in effect saying if uh, the expenditures exceed what we project in the budget resolution with some uh, margin for error, uh, then we will have to make a decision. Either we will vote to spend more and borrow more or we'll vote to tax or we'll vote to cut. And uh, that is, I think, a very, very important budget reform that I certainly hope this committee will help us uh, get in order uh, on the floor of the House. I thank thank you very much, Mr. Slattery. To be here. Mr. Loraca. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. <clears throat> of course, I haven't been here during the eight hours of your deliberations, but quite frankly, I think that this uh, is the most important amendment to come before you for deliberation today, and I applaud Mr. Stenholm and others for bringing this amendment to you. Um, the deficit hawks who are new members of uh, this Congress, uh, new members of the House, and myself who came here in 1990, uh, most of us are in strong, strong support of that, and that's why I appear before you today, because I lend my strong support to this. The words that have been used about this amendment are key. The words are guarantee, enforcement, discipline, caps, and promises. I feel that this is truly a nonpartisan issue, and I think that uh, we should move this amendment to the floor for full consideration. I don't see any better work than we can do that could, to complete the work that we've done already in the reconciliation package by limiting the spending that we will have for five years on, on discretionary parts of the budget, but we must move to the non-discretionary parts of the budget. As we all know, the health care costs in America have driven these costs right through the roof. This sets a cap. And for those of you who have concerns, as I did when I first studied this amendment, this is not a throw grandma from the nursing home uh, amendment. This is only a cap that causes action by the President and subsequently by the House of Representatives to act. And I think it's very, very important that we act squarely, that we act decisively on this. My uh, colleagues have already described this amendment in their detail, but I would say in great detail. But I think that America deserves this amendment. I think America expects this amendment. All America is waiting up for us to act, not only on the, non, the discretionary part of the budget, but on the non-discretionary part. I think that if we don't bring this amendment to the floor and, quite frankly, pass it, that the financial markets and the bond markets will know that we are not sincere about true budget deficit reduction. I think that this is very, very important, and uh, we need to legislate the necessary uh, discipline, and we need to force the desired enforcement. And uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for this opportunity. Mr. Penny, why don't you come up to the table? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join my colleagues uh, in uh, requesting uh, of this committee an opportunity for us to uh, deal with enforcement caps uh, within the budget uh, reconciliation bill. Um, 
if we can work out some arrangement and have those uh, incorporated into the bill through uh, uh, a rule, that would certainly be satisfactory. If not, we would request an amendment on the floor to uh, address the need for uh, caps uh, on entitlement spending as, as part of the uh, enforcement process of this budget re reconciliation package. Uh, in addition, I have worked with other members who have some interest in um, offering amendments or substitutes that might involve additional spending cuts. Uh, if and when they appear before your committee, I would urge you give uh, favorable consideration to their uh, request. Uh, it may be true, and I think it perhaps is true, that uh, we, we don't have the votes uh, in the House uh, to approve cuts beyond those that are in the package, but uh, clearly there are a number of members that would like to demonstrate their support for additional cuts, uh, and uh, at the very least uh, they, have, they ought to have an opportunity to uh, register uh, their position on, on that particular issue. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I have some specific language uh, on budget reconciliation that I would like to uh, submit, and I have two specific amendments that uh, uh, deal with spending cuts that I would like to have this committee make in order. One would uh, put a cap on Medicare, uh, would, would uh, uh, put a higher premium on Medicare Part B uh, beneficiaries, uh, those uh, with uh, incomes of $125,000 or more, uh, and uh, the other amendment uh, would deal with a limitation on cost of living uh, increases. Uh, it would be designed uh, so that we would allow uh, every uh, retiree uh, to uh, secure up to $400 uh, per year in, uh, in benefit increases, uh, but uh, we would limit uh, increases beyond that level. Um, uh, again, uh, there may be others that would request this committee for amendments that would deal with additional spending reductions. Uh, those are the two that I'm specifically interested in and would ask your consideration. Without objection, your <coughs> gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. Uh, Mr. Solomon. <coughs> uh, let me uh, commend you gentlemen for uh, bringing this amendment uh, before this body. Uh, I've discussed the, this issue with, uh, with most of you uh, at one time or another. And, during the debate on the, uh, the budget a couple of months ago, one of my uh, strongest objections were that uh, beyond the year 1995, there were no spending controls at all. And uh, uh, the spending controls that we did have in uh, the remaining five-year budget of President Bush before uh, really didn't have much teeth in it either because this Rules Committee and its infinite wisdom could waive the Budget Act at, at any time it wants. And as I've been skimming through your uh, your amendment and I look at page 13 and you talk about the authority provided to the Secretary of the Treasury and such and such a title uh, to borrow on the credit of the United States to meet public expenditures authorized by law shall be suspended and as I read your amendment that um, that would prohibit this rules committee from waiving the Budget Act uh, because it would take an act of Congress, not just an act of this Rules Committee or the House. Is that correct? In other words, the Secretary of the Treasury would not be able to, uh, uh, to borrow on the credit of the United States to meet public expenditures authorized by law sh shall be suspended. Is Char Charlie, could you elaborate on that? What does that mean to you? That What's your legislative intent? That any spending that shall occur over and above the caps in the budget that's under discretion could not be borrowed until Congress acts. And an action can be a vote to borrow the money. But what we're after in this amendment, purely and simply, is to take entitlement spending off of autopilot and put it back in the hands of the Congress. That's, that's what we're attempting to do. And that's what this enforcement mechanism is, is designed to do, saying we cannot borrow more money. That doesn't say government shuts down. That doesn't say the Social Security checks stop and anything else that goes with previous discussions we've had. But only the additional spending, unless we act, and this is what we call a hammer in the proposal, something to force us to act so that we, in fact, vote to borrow the money with a recorded vote on the floor of the House, or we vote to make expenditure cuts, or we vote to raise taxes, or a combination thereof. Let me just, could I just interject sure. one thing? I, know, Jim. I, I see this as really a fundamental reform in, in the way we do business around here. And if you just think about this for a second, the, the, the fact that we are really talking about taking that 48% of our, our budget off of autopilot is a fundamental change. 
And I just would hope that uh, we can convince our colleagues that we're at a point in history where the American taxpayers are demanding that we belly up to some of the tough choices that we have to make in this area of the budget. And if we're not willing to do this, as sure as I'm sitting here, we're not going to solve our deficit problem. And we all know that what a big part of uh, this entitlement package health care is. And, and later on this fall, the President is committed to dealing with some kind of caps on health care. And what we, I believe this is very consistent with what the President is attempting to do. Well, I just, uh, I just say that uh, I, <clears throat> I have uh, previously written uh, our good Chairman uh, Joseph Moakley uh, uh, about uh, your, your approach, uh, Mr. McMillan's, and several other approaches, uh, one of which is my own. Uh, to hold hearings to uh, to try to get this kind of legislation enacted in the law because really there are there is no teeth in the existing procedure uh, and uh, and I for one would strongly support this if we could make it in order uh, I hope we can uh, as you gentlemen know uh, the in spite of a 246 billion dollar tax increase uh, the deficit levels uh, as I was discussing with Ross Perot the other day and I know you some of you were too the deficit levels uh, remain for the next five years way over $200 billion a year for an accumulated total of uh, over $1.2 trillion. And uh, something has got to be done with that. Otherwise, the, the debt service payment uh, alone is going to be more than we spend on our national defense budget in uh, just a few years down the pipe. So uh, I hope we can make your amendment in order. I hope we can uh, uh, make a number of these amendments in order. But you're certainly entitled to it. It's a major issue that ought to be debated on the floor. Charlie. Yeah, I was, I was just going to observe that, uh, you know, I, I think the president should get a little more credit for some of the things he has proposed and not as much criticism. Uh, it was mentioned a moment ago, the discretionary freeze, which is significant, which I think most of us who uh, have dealt with the budget understand what it means to say we will spend no more in discretionary spending in 1998 than we did in 1993. We understand the pressure that that's going to bring on business as usual. We think that, that this is a, is a necessary addition to that. Also, I would hope that we could begin to understand that on the one hand, we should not be criticizing the president for his budget in its entirety and agreeing that we ought to do something with entitlements, but then objecting when the president recommends that we do something about entitlements. Entitlements are Social Security as well as a lot of other programs. And I don't think we're going to be able to have it both ways as we talk about this. We can't say we've got to do something about entitlements, but accept, accept, accept. And I think, and I, I had hoped at this time, and I, I don't say this as personal criticism, just as a reminder to myself in some of my own rhetoric, that when we talk about entitlement reform, we're talking about entitlement reform. And Mr. Slattery just said this is significant, perhaps just a baby bite. But this is a significant baby bite in moving in the direction. I know you want to go, Mr. Solomon, and I think I'm speaking for a large number of other members on both sides of the aisle, that we want to find a bipartisan way to get there. And I would hope that we could uh, uh, use a little care in our own rhetoric as we proceed down this very treacherous path. Well, I hope for the sake of the country we do find a bipartisan approach, uh, Charlie, and uh, I thank you, gentlemen, for coming before us. Mr. Frost of Texas. I would ask uh, Mr. Stenholm, uh, what are the current differences between you and, and the administration on this proposal? You indicated at the beginning of your statement, I believe, that there have been discussions, but that uh, there has been no closure on the matter, and that that's why you're here uh, uh, protecting your rights before the committee, asking that your uh, amendment be made in order. W what are the main differences at this point? The main differences is the hammer is what we call the hammer, and that is to guarantee that we do something. What we're, what we're after is trying to guarantee a vote. And we're, we have been thus far, not so much with the administration, uh, I, I want to make this clear, I, I uh, feel like that uh, we are uh, getting in sync with the administration on this. But we have many of our colleagues who are concerned about doing what we're, we have just talked about doing. And it's the enforcement mechanism. It's 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 the concern that we have that if we do nothing, which we're good at doing around here from time to time, that the spending goes ahead and goes on. That's why we we believe that a hammer like we propose or something similar to it, so that if we do nothing, and again keep in mind the only action that we are requiring at this time with this is a vote is a vote of the House and the Senate with the President concurring that we borrow the money if the caps are, are uh, 
exceeded. That's that's the principal sticking point. There's a few other little minor cats and dogs that could be uh, perhaps worked out in a satisfactory way for all parties concerned. Um, also, I would ask, how does your proposal in its current form differ from uh, the idea uh, floated by Mr. Spratt of South Carolina? Mr. Spratt's uh, ideas have, uh, have suggested that there could be some additional adjustments, uh, some additional rec recognition of demographic changes, inflationary changes, uh, economic changes. Well, don't, you pro don't you provide for that in yours? We, uh, we provide for uh, 260 billion of them, but Mr. Spratt, trying to find a middle ground between where we are and where some of our colleagues would like to be, has suggested this. This, this uh, has not been acceptable to us. We, in other words, we assume the entitlement spending levels that are part of the budget resolution, essentially the President's projection for entitlement inflation. spending over the next uh, several years, which includes an inflation factor, is what, is, what we, is what we buy into. We set our caps at that level. The, does it include both inflation and demographic change? Yes, it does. Well, then, I, I'm not the, sure, I don't but, understand uh, how is Mr. Spratt different? Then? Mr. Spratt differs to the degree that he would, he would uh, allow for an annual adjustment in demographics to reflect any changes in demographics that differ from, from the initial projection, mm -hmm. and he also allows an annual adjustment oh, okay. on the inflation factor. So if inflation is assumed in the... In the 1993 budget, 1994 budget, to be 4 percent per year, but it turns out to be 5 percent in one year and 6 percent in another, he would automatically adjust that. Mm -hmm. Our plan stays with the original projection, which then forces us to come in and figure out how to pay for the additional infa inflation factor. Or and, borrow the money. And yours is over what period of years, Charlie? Five years. Five years. Uh, if I may ask one other question. Um, I know that uh, being from, uh, from our state, from the state of Texas, that, uh, that you have serious reservations about the BTU tax. Um, if, uh, if your amendment were made in order and were accepted, were, were passed by the House, uh, would you then be able to, uh, to vote for reconciliation, uh, your, uh, your problems with the BTU tax notwithstanding? Yes. Yes, we, we have concentrated in this particular area for all of our discussions. Uh, as you state, I am very troubled by the BTU tax. I think it is most unfair. My district is oil and gas and agriculture, and it hits us very hard. But I am, uh, you know, I understand the legislative process. We have worked our will to this degree to getting 218 votes in the House. I have great expectations that substantial changes are going to be made in the Senate and I'm willing to uh, take this amendment and I believe this improves the package uh, substantially and moves the process forward and will you know, reserve my judgment for the final passage of a conference report as to whether or not we've uh, worked it satisfactorily. Well, I, I would like, Mr. Chairman, I would like to, to commend my colleague, uh, Mr. Stenholm, for the constructive role that he is playing in this process. And uh, I hope that uh, prior to uh, a final resolution of this matter uh, by this committee uh, and by the uh, House on the floor tomorrow that uh, there can be some accommodation reached with uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Stone. Be very helpful. I concur. I, I think you, you and your uh, colleagues have been uh, very instrumental in, in, giving, um, in giving a time to this type of uh, a substitute. Uh, you're still in negotiations, I, I understand. As soon as we leave here, we're going back. Okay. And uh, are you getting any closer to uh, getting a different size hammer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we, we may have gone from a ball peen size junior to a ball peen size junior plus. You know, you could get too, too heavy a hammer and strain yourself, you know. You've got to be we careful. We don't want to go too far too fast, yeah. but... Uh, uh, I don't think I'm, we're I'm, I'm optimistic that we are moving in the right direction and that we might have an accommodation that yeah. will probably please a few and displease a, a few. No, yeah, just like the present uh, bill we have before us. I mean, everybody hates something in it, you know, the, the, the Social Security, the BTU, and, but uh, you know you've been around a long time that you start taking the ribbon off and you don't know what's going to jump out and land where and 
how to put the package back together again. Well, you, you, you put this amendment in, in order, and uh, you got a few more votes than you had before we started. Like, how, many, how many are we short now? <laughs> no, we're not. He didn't say that. <laughs> might change, you telling Mr. Solomon might change Mr. Solomon's, Solomon's mind about <laughs> helping us out. <laughs> 18 is moving up, huh? <laughs> how many uh, votes would this bring to the table, Charlie? Do you know? One, two, <laughs> three. <laughs> You mean have your entire army in front of us? Five. Now we're, six. Now we're, now we're only 12 short. Six. <laughs> we're making progress. We're doing better here than we are anywhere else. <laughs> Mr. Quillen. I'm not only amazed, but I'm amused. That's nice. You know, it seems to me that the can't. boy involved is to make your amendments in order and then kick it in the fanny. And then you'll support the, the measure as a whole. You're not being lead, uh, led down the beaten path, are you? No, sir. No. Well, I, what assurance are we going to have that your amendment is going to be adopted? We got kind of pretty good encouragement a moment ago from on the floor. I'll give oh. you 176 votes right now. We get it on the floor, we'll pass it. If you don't pass it, where are you? Big trouble. <laughs> well, are you still going to vote for the tax bill? Well, and I, I've, I've been answering that question. I, I only take one at a time. My little limited computer. Well, listen, now, I'm on your side, Charlie. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm against the whole shebang, but yes, sir. well then you're I'm not on my side. Down a beaten path. <laughs> they give them a rubber with mallet. The false, no, with a false promise. I've seen the amendments be made in order, then kicked in the pants, and uh, then you're committed. Is that the way it is? But, but, no, would the gentleman you, the gentleman from Tennessee, you? Oh, I'd be glad to you. Uh, I, my, I asked Mr. Stenholm the question earlier, and, and my specific question was if his amendment were adopted on the floor. And I think he, when he responded to my question that he would vote for the bill on passage, it was with the understanding that uh, his amendment would be adopted on the yes. floor. Well, that's, that's what you're asking. That's Yes. That's true, but I'm uh, I'm crossing the bridge. If it isn't adopted, where are you? Well, we're back at the drawing board thinking. Well, you have a good mind, all of you, and you come in uh, in, in pairs equal to five, equal to the bypasses that I. I believe, I believe we have a sex tap. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've been in session too long. You. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got a good idea. Don't be, don't be misled. You're smart. All of you are smart. And we're, we're teetering right now. Not on our side, but it seems like other people are. I hope you don't. Thank you, for Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want you gentlemen to know that I am extraordinarily disappointed that you haven't tackled the issues of deposit insurance and interest payments on the debt. <laughs> when are you going to come with us with a proposal we can get tough and deal with those things? One I, step at a time, Mr. Dreyer. I think, you got a, I think you got a great package here, and I applaud you for standing up to the entitlement question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. All right, we'll get him. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, I think this is a fact. After nine hours, I understand why. It's worn out. I think it's a fabulous proposal, and I would love to have the opportunity to uh, every so often if the trigger does apply, uh, get up and defend why I think the senior citizens that are going to be negatively affected if we don't do the proper thing uh, should have proper attention. And I think that's a very reasonable proposition. I'm not sure it will be characterized that way, but uh, I'm comfortable trying to characterize it that way. I do have a um, couple of uh, concerns, though. I guess the, the issue that is driving you, you're, you're coming very close to uh, talking about affordability. Uh, the reason for doing this, we are going to have a trigger that's going to shut down automatic changes, automatic increases, uh, because we come up against caps. 
Now, what that basically means, then, is we're going to have an action which is going to be a vote. And that vote, we're going to have to determine, can we afford to do this? This is the right priority. And my concern there is that when you start talking about affordability, you're starting to talk about some things that are not normally talked about in this town, particularly in this place. Affordability is not a word I've heard used uh, very few times uh, in my uh, four and some years here. Uh, maybe you've heard it more often. I think it's great that you're proposing that we start talking about affordability. The second thing, uh, Mr. Slattery said something I thought was terrific. Uh, we're going to have the courage to face the, the runaway problem on entitlements. And, and I represent a lot of senior citizens, and I have been very hesitant to jump into doing things uh, to senior citizens uh, under the guise of doing things for senior citizens because we're never quite sure what it's going to come out as. But I would love to have uh, a very good program to support to deal with the entitlements. And I think all of us would. Uh, we know how serious this deficit problem and the economic problem is. I'll be, I am deadly serious about this. My concern is that we cannot pass the laugh test on the spending that we do right now in this government. There is just too much that just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Wrong tire, wrong a target, low priority, clear waste, clear pork, taking care of a friend, uh, all of those things we read about. And, and until we can deal with that a little better than we're dealing with it now, we haven't got to have the credibility, in my view, to get to this affordability question you've properly put out there. And if you can give me any advice on how we deal with that, I'd love to know. Let me, let me just try to respond a little bit. And um, when we talk about all this pork... Um, no, I'm not talking about just pork. Right. I'm talking about less important projects as okay. well. I guess the bottom line is this. We are imposing, as you know, a hard freeze for five years on the discretionary part of the budget. Yep. Never done that before. And uh, that is going to be tough medicine for all of us. Agreed. And uh, I think that's going to have the effect of squeezing out a lot of low priorities. I predict that the uh, space station, the super collider, mm -hmm. and some other things may be victims of this hard freeze that we're imposing on discretionary spending. And I think that if we can extend this restraint, you might say, to the entitlement side of the, of the ledger, then we are closing the loop. And this is the, the side of the ledger, frankly, that Republicans have not been willing to deal with, nor have Democrats been willing to deal with. And I think that the American people have at long last started to understand that if we ever are going to get our deficit under control, we have to deal with that 48% of the budget we call entitlements. We have no other choice. The arithmetic demands it. If we had the same wisdom that you're displaying on waste as uh, we are having the wisdom you're displaying on the entitlement question here, I think we would be doing very well. Sadly enough, I think it's still missing. And I, one last point I would make is, is that, you know, our body the House has already passed the modified line item veto proposal, which will, I think, give the President an important uh, tool to identify projects and force that individual vote, which I think is also going to work to eliminate some of the waste that you're concerned How, how's about. How's that coming over in the Senate? Maybe we can uh, keep the pressure on. I, I hope the Senate will act, but, uh, you know, I have about as much influence over there as the gentleman from New York, probably, so maybe less after today. <laughs> I got one little final point for well me. If I may, just to respond to uh, Mr. Goss, uh, this package, the reconciliation package, cuts $87 billion from uh, entitlement programs. So it's not just in the uh, uh, discretionary part of the bu budget where we have true spending cuts. So when the freeze happens, uh, uh, we've, we've eaten into that program as well, or this bill does that's uh, coming before us tomorrow. I, I, as I say, I, th I certainly think this is very, very worthy of debate because I think we're finally getting to what the issues are here and trying to find middle ground on them, and I think this is the first time we've really done that today. Uh, th I'd like to ask one question. I'll rephrase this question. Maybe Mr. Stenholm will be able to answer this one. I won't ask you how you're going to vote on the administration package. I'll just ask you if you'd be able to support the rule if your amendment is not made in order. Well, you know, I, I've already voted in favor of the basic outlines of the budget proposal. I'm on the budget committee. We we moved it through the budget committee, through the floor of the House. And no, the I understand that. The confines of that is something that I have already on in support of. So, now your question... Now, my question was, will we be able to support the rule if your amendment's not made in no, order? No, I have made it very clear that we, in all Thank of you. our accounts that we will not support the rule unless a uh, satisfactory uh, part of our amendment will be made in order. We've made that very clear, very open, uh, all the way through the chairman and whip counts and everyone else. We feel like that this is an accommodation that must be reached. And, and again, 
This uh, should not shock anybody because we have been saying this all the way through the budget process. This is where this decision is made here in the Rules Committee. Uh, the budget and all the rest of it comes out uh, you know, in the various other jurisdictions. You know, besides affordability, I think another word I'd like to interject uh, too is prioritization. That's fine. And uh, it, affordability and prioritization, which uh, again, Mr. Slattery has brought it up, I want to reinforce it because the, pre the package before us, I think, should get a little bit praise from your side of the aisle on the discretionary freeze. That is significant to those of us, Mr. Solomon and Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Goss, Mr. Quinlan, all of us who have worked bipartisanly for spending cuts, we have not seen anything like this in the last five years, 10 years, or 12 years on spending reductions. Nothing, nothing we have done, seen, proposed by anyone in the past 12 years compares to a discretionary freeze with caps, with sequestration, if we do not meet it in the discretionary side of the budget. We ought to be talking about that as good. I, I am very much prepared to one more time say that I applaud that. What I would really like to have is a long-standing ovation for the whole package, and we aren't there yet. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yeah, we, we agree on that, too. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen, for a very uh, good presentation here. Mr. McCandless. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, we got a copy. Thanks. I, I didn't have an autograph one, though. <laughs> where's, uh, where's Bob Walker? Is he with you? Yes. He left. I understand there's a boat on the floor or something. Yes. No, not yet. Unless he's uh, <laughs> knows something we don't know. Oh, I see. Why don't you Gentlemen, may proceed. Sure, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity of being able to appear before you and the rest of the committee on an amendment which I intended to offer in the Government Operations Committee. Unfortunately, when it became clear that the committee did not have the votes needed to pass the leadership bill, the measure was pulled and our members were denied the opportunity to consider the Budget Enforcement Act legislation. Given its denial in government operations, I believe the Rules <coughs> Committee should permit the members of the House the opportunity to debate the merits of the President's Deficit Reduction Trust Fund and alternate deficit reduction measures on the floor of the House. My amendment would provide that opportunity by offering members clear choice between the President's trust fund idea and the widely acclaimed Walker Smith Debt Buy-Down Act. This amendment will offer a deficit reduction plan acknowledged by both OMB and CBO to provide real cuts and real savings. The amendment takes a three-pronged approach to deficit reduction by first permitting taxpayers to designate up to 10 percent of their total taxes for deficit reduction. Second, it requiring Congress to enact spending cuts equal to the total amount of the tax set aside, and third, enforcing those spending reductions by imposing sequestration equal to the amount of the overspending. The total amount of the lowered spending would then serve as budget authority baseline for the next fiscal year. According to both OMB and the trend line from CBO, this amendment would enable the government to stop deficit spending by the year 1999. Additionally, the national debt would be eliminated by the year 2009, even with a 9.55% increase over baseline fiscal year 1994 spending. Mr. Chairman, I urge you to consider the real deficit savings offered by this amendment against the false promises of the trust fund idea. In fact, given the number of highly respected budget scholars who are seeking to distance themselves from the President's Trust Fund, I marvel at its inclusion in the Reconciliation Bill. Rather than limiting the members of this body to consider a Trust Fund idea, I urge the committee to permit a vote on real deficit reduction to make my amendment in order. Mr. Chairman, is my understanding following uh, conversations with parliamentarians that uh, this amendment will require a rule waiver. They inform me that the section which permits taxpayers to designate funding to be set aside will require a Rule 5A waiver. I request that that waiver be granted in lieu of, uh, in addition to what we're talking about here in the way of, a, of an amendment. Additionally, I would like to offer my support 
for an amendment being offered by my ranking minority member on government operations, Bill Klinger. Congressman Klinger has proposed an amendment to define the term emergency as it is used in supplemental appropriations. His amendment would limit Congress circumvention of the budget's discretionary spending caps by defining emergency as an authentic, sudden, and unforeseen crisis. Mr. Chairman, this amendment would provide an important first step in restraining the body's uncontrolled spending habits. It's a good amendment, and I urge its inclusion in the rule. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time and the members of the committee. I appreciate your Thanks consideration. Thanks very much, Mr. McCandless. Uh, Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Al, uh, you had written a... Uh, you, you had written uh, a letter uh, asking us to support your amendment. I'm going to yield to Dave Dreyer in just a minute, uh, but I would ask unanimous consent that your letter and the copies of your amendments be uh, submitted Without objection, for the record. The entire statement will appear on the and, record. And would yield to the gentleman from California who is going to make the motion on your amendment. I uh, thank my friend for yielding. I just uh, wanted to congratulate you for coming forward. We're sorry that you weren't able to offer this in the Government Operations Committee. This is an idea which was discussed, as we know, in the presidential campaign. This is something that uh, many people have been drawn to, and I think that uh, if we are going to get serious about turning the corner on the national debt, these sorts of creative ways uh, are going to be the way that we will do it. And I, uh, I think you've come forward with a great idea and wholeheartedly support it, and I'll look forward to offering it when we mark up the rule. I thank, thank you for your kind words. Obviously, it has other sponsors of longstanding. Uh... Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Quillen? Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. A very good presentation. Thank you. Mr. Goss. I only will say that uh, very little that we have discussed today has any sex appeal at all. I think this is a good, sexy proposal, and I hope we can get it out there for you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think that's a great exit line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is check in the mail? Yes. The uh, chair recognized the Honorable Mike Sina. Sina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be very brief. I know we're about to go into a vote. Uh, you know, last fall, Ross Perot received 19% of the popular vote nationwide, and since that time, his campaign has continued, and he continues to come up with proposals for deficit reduction. In fact, uh, I think it's probably as timely as ever to ask that Congress go yay or nay on the proposals that Mr. Perot has. So today, I'm asking the Rules Committee to make an order uh, Ross Pro five-year deficit reduction plan. I do that as chairman of the Democratic Study Group who wants to make sure that the debate is complete. Tomorrow we'll have a very bipartisan debate. I'd like to make it tripartisan. Excuse me, is, is that amendment it's, before us? It should be. I've provided all the material to the Rules Committee. If there is a better and easier way to achieve our deficit goals, I think we should be looking for them. And maybe Mr. Perot has come up with that formula that would better work for the members. The substitute reconciliation package drafted from the proposals which were contained in Ross Perot's most recent book, Not for Sale at Any Price, How We Can Save America for Our Children. There were 21 specific deficit reduction proposals in the book. Five were simply too vague, however, to be translated into legislation without a great deal of uh, specific uh, more information from the author. However, fortunately, 16 of the 21 were sufficiently precise to permit the bill drafters to prepare a legislative format. Of the $570 billion in the Perot deficit reduction proposals germane to the reconciliation bill, $515 billion, or 90 percent, could be drafted into reconciliation language. They are the net tax increases of $306 billion and the net entitlement cuts of $209 billion. In addition, Mr. Perot uh, proposes a $38 billion reduction over five years in discretionary spending to be accomplished in appropriations bills over the next five years. The Perot plan, as it was drafted, adds up to about $110 billion more in deficit reduction than the package reported by the House Budget Committee. And the total spending cuts are about $55 billion more than those in the House Democratic bill, while taxes are about $55 billion higher. The parole plan offers we as members of the House a clear choice. It is a very different plan than the House Democratic plan with higher taxes overall, higher taxes on the middle class in particular, 
and sharply deeper cuts in key entitlements. There's one additional reason why I come here today for this proposal to be considered. Governance in a democracy requires not only that you come up with the best substantive solution, but also that you can gain agreement among half or more of the elected representatives of the people on behalf of these solutions. It is based on that criteria that much of the recent criticism of the president has been leveled. By now finally permitting a vote floor, uh, floor vote on the parole pro proposal, we will allow that proposal to be measured by both of these yardstick measures. I ask the committee get, to give it serious consideration. Mike, did you say that the, the, uh, the proposal uh, of Mr. Perot is adds fi $55 uh, million dollars more in tax spent, uh, taxes uh, than the Democratic bill does? That is correct. About $55 billion more in net increases in taxes and about $55 billion net cuts in entitlements. What does he do with gasoline? The major portion of his revenues come from a 50, per, 50 cent increase in the gasoline tax over a five year period. That will accumulate around $157.8 billion. It would be 10 cents the first year, 20, 30, 40, and 50 in the next four years. And uh, is there any other, uh, is there any other uh, tax uh, programs that are different from the Democratic uh, bill? Well, let me just click off the ones on how he does it. It's very simple. A gasoline tax, uh, which gets us about $157 billion. Tax on employer paid insurance of uh, premiums over $335 a month for family coverage would get us another $57 billion. He would increase the individual top tax rate from 31 to 33, which would be $33 billion. He would increase the taxation of Social Security benefits, and that would get us another $30 billion. He would also repeal the cap on the Medicare parole tax, uh, payroll tax, which would be $28.9 uh, billion. He would increase the tobacco tax to $0.24 cents a pack, $18.6 billion. He would restrict business entertainment deductions from 80 down to 50, which gets us $15 billion. And one interesting one, which I think a lot of Americans didn't understand, is that he would lower the maximum mortgage principal eligible for mortgage interest deductions from one million to 250,000 for taxpayers' principal residents, which would raise 15.8 billion dollars. And, and what, how does he tax Social Security? He would basically tax Social Security. He would increase the fraction of Social Security benefits included in the adjusted gross income and tax it up to 85 percent of the benefits instead of the current 50 percent of the benefits. Starting at what? Uh, current uh, thresholds. Current thresholds. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Mike, uh, having just seen this, and I've been trying to just uh, skim through it, but uh, this has not been scored by CBO, has it? Uh, Most of the measures within the Perot package have not only been scored by Perot, but they have been uh, gathered from other sections of either the Democratic proposals or former proposals where they have been previously scored by CBO. Uh, Mr. Solomon, on the only two that we were not, were not able to find, one which was the permanent 10% incremental investment tax credit for all businesses, what we did is we went to H.R. 1960, which was uh, in Congress on May 4th, as probably the best way to come as close to that number. Uh, that bill, as you remember, was an administration proposal of 7%. He goes to 10%. The other one was the stair-step capital gains reduction. In, in trying to score that one, we went to the 1989 Packwood Capital Gains Bill, S1771, to come up with that number. But with, with the exception of the five vague proposals, each one of these have already been scored at some time by CBO. So we think we're within, let's say, a 5% differential here. But I, I see uh, items in here like uh, eliminate wasteful subsidies. And uh, it just says an estimate uh, of savings, $21.9 billion. Well, let's take that. That can't be scored, well, can For it? example, on the cuts on farm supports, where Perot calls for cutting farm support 17 billion, yeah. there was no really further definition by Mr. Perot in his book. To draft that, we simply found a CBO option that calls for a broad cut in farm support programs, and we scored that this way. It involves cutting target prices by 3% a year, over the next five years, and that saves about $13 billion, so that's within the ballpark. Well, you know, I just, uh, Ross Perot and I, over the years, and I've worked with him for 
15 years on the POWMIA issues when I was on foreign affairs, and uh, sometimes we've had our differences. But I, I really don't think this is fair to to present this as uh, as the Ross Perot uh, alternative. Uh, it, if, if I were going to do this, what I would have done, I would have uh, called up Mr. Perot and I would have said, Mr. Perot, I'd like to offer your package as an alternative. And uh, uh, would you give me all the details and I'll have it drafted and I'll submit it for you. It, um, it just doesn't seem quite fair. There's, there's some of the things in here I like, some I dislike. I hate the 50 cent gasoline tax. And, uh, but um, I really don't think we ought to present it as the, as the Ross Perot budget because well, um, with all due respect the book has only been out for three weeks and it uh -huh. has detailed specific budget recommendations and that's when uh, we went in and put the budget together on the five vague ones we gave him the benefit of the doubt of not putting those in there and in the ones where there had not been a, a detailed analysis we went to the best legislation available that really represented the theme of what he was trying to do and I think it's perfectly reflective of what he is trying to accomplish in his deficit reduction package as illustrated in his book, Not for Sale at Any Price, How We Can Save America for Our Children. But you have not personally talked to him about it? Uh... No, but he called the office today and asked for my testimony and papers, and Mr. Slattery uh, talked to him today, and he was kind of excited that his uh, plan might be considered by the, uh, the full mm -hmm. house. Okay. Did he call you, attorney? No, he didn't call me. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Quillen. Mr. Chairman, I'm amazed that we have to go outside of the Congress to offer an amendment or a substitute by an individual. I think we build Mr. Pro up to something that he is not. In my opinion, he's nothing but a troublemaker and I'm amazed, Mike, that you would come here and ask us to make this amendment in order as a parole substitute. When do we have to go outside of this house to find somebody to offer an amendment or a substitute? If we don't have the knowledge, I think it's ridiculous. I'll vote against it. Parole, to me, is a fine individual personally he's made money and he deserves a lot of credit but he's not going to rule this house as far as i'm concerned and if president clinton wants him to do that then i think president clinton should bring him here to the house floor and say i endorse his principles i endorse his philosophy and let's see who wins the gentleman yelled I'd be happy to. You. I didn't think this was the parole Clinton budget. Wasn't it just the parole budget? No, in fact, I gave no forewarning to the administration I was going to do this, nor the leadership. This is uh, generated from the Democratic Study Group, and I take full uh, credit for it. Let me say that in a, we're in a unique period of time when a, a person gets 19% of the popular vote and continues that campaign since the election and has proposed specific things. Uh, he will be on TV this Sunday again, uh, proposing even further uh, recommendations. I think as members of Congress, we have an obligation to our constituencies uh, to basically review all alternatives. If there's a better one out there that we haven't thought of, we would be remiss in our duties if we didn't give it some kind of consideration. I offer this today not intending to support it because I'm opposed to it for many reasons which have already been mentioned. But I think it gives us an opportunity to look at the full picture of options that are available. Let me tell you what we're going through here is an exercise which we will have to repeat many times in the years ahead. And I think it's important the American people know what options we considered, which ones we accepted, which ones we rejected, and why. And leaving Ross Perot out of the debate is ignoring the reality of what his presence does to this whole uh, debate uh, as we proceed. Well, I disagree with you. I think on our side of the aisle, if we came up with a, budget, a Bush substitute or a Reagan substitute or a, any, any, any substitute other than from a member of this body, I think it would be ridiculous. And I think you're agreeing to do that as a ploy to get votes for the uh, tax bill. And I don't support it. I'm amazed with your intelligence that you would bring it here 
as a parole substitute. I, okay. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Goss. Thank you. I, we have four minutes left to vote, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't take that long. May I have a uh, request consent to submit the statement of the Honorable William F. Klinger, Ranking Minority Member, Committee of Government Operations. Without objection. So, thank you. I, uh, I've, I've got to say I'm a little taken aback uh, by this. Uh, I had hoped to see uh, the, um, the uh, economic plan uh, from putting people first uh, before I saw the Perot one, and I'm still waiting for that one. Um, and, and I really do think it's unfair to other members. I can't help but say this. I mean, we work hard. We joke around about things now. And this is serious business. And uh, members have gone out and worked hard in good faith and gotten the voices of their districts and tried to craft meaningful and sensible amendments, uh, trying to bring the debate to uh, some kind of a focus that we can get our hands on, and to insert uh, a gentleman who has a lot of visibility for sure, some notoriety, a uh, great deal of respect in many circles, a lot of ideas and so forth, but to somehow uh, cloak him in the respectability of elected official who has a right to participate in this debate from the floor of the House, to me is a little demeaning to our colleagues, and I will not be able to support this request. Well, I appreciate that, but I, I have to tell you that a citizen of this country has the right to petition their government. Mr. Perot continues to do that. Uh, if, he has if, as much right to have his ideas considered as people... Absolutely, and if the gentleman were going to put this through as an amendment under your name, I would be the first I'm one... I'm offering it in my... As, in, oh, so in this my will name. not be the Perot plan, this will be the signer plan. This will be the signer plan. Obviously, he cannot... I am sorry. In, in that case, if you, you're telling me you're going to offer the Sinar plan, but you're going to vote against the Sinar plan, if I heard the testimony right. Did I hear what that right? What you have heard is, is that as DSG chairman, I believe that I have a responsibility to allow members to have a complete review of all the information that is available out there and the proposals, options, etc. And that without the parole plan being in play or under consideration, We've done a disservice to our colleagues as well as to the people of this country from a person who received 19 percent of the popular vote. Well, lots of people receive parts of votes that aren't here and going to have the opportunity to speak from the well, and we all know that. Uh, I don't know how your race was, but I know that I had somebody else in my race, and he isn't here, and I am, and it's my job to do my job. But I, don't, I believe that if you were going to support the, the uh, parole package, I could support you. But you haven't been able to find anybody apparently who's going to support the parole package. So I don't believe it has the right to use our time when there are other credible amendments out there that ought to get that debate time, which is very precious. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sinai. Thank you. The committee will be in brief recess. Too cute right now. Yeah. All right, you all are uh, welcome to read your statement or have it submitted for the record or whatever you prefer. Mr. Schumer? Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chairperson. And, uh, let me thank the Rules Committee for meeting at this uh, fairly late hour, the opportunity for us to present our idea. And I'll be brief because I know you've uh, had a long time. Um, we're here together, the four of us and Chet Edwards of Texas, uh, have worked for many months on the idea of a deficit reduction trust fund. The bottom line is that we think the President's budget's strongest selling point, as well as strongest substantive point, is that it reduces the deficit rather significantly. Combination of taxes and, and uh, spending cuts, but $496 billion of deficit reduction over five years, bringing the deficit down in half after 12 years of deficit going up, 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 to us is exactly the tonic that America needs and the tonic that the public wants us to do. And Bill Clinton proved that he was a uh, new Democrat when he got away from tax and spend and instead went to deficit reduction. The problem we feel in terms of the President's budget is first, that the issue of deficit reduction wasn't framed or highlighted, but secondly, that the public doesn't believe any of us in Washington when we say, yes, we do have to make painful cuts. Yes, we do have to raise taxes. 
but we're putting it in, putting it for deficit reduction. And so what we have put together is a pl is a trust fund that says that at the end of each year, the net of tax increases and spending cuts goes into this trust fund and can't be taken out. Therefore, um, what we're trying to do is very simply assure the American people that the promise that was made that this money would go to deficit reduction actually happens. And uh, just briefly, I would urge the Rules Committee to support this. It's the kind of idea that could unite Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. Uh, it's the kind of thing that Presidents Reagan and Bush talked about, never got around to doing for, we could differ on the reasons for that, but the kind of thing that America needs and wants. Mr. Wise? I would like to add that there is, this is not an, a new idea, particularly in the sense that in the Budget Committee for the last three years there has been specific language in the budget report, I know because I've had a hand in putting it there, that has recommended the looking at or the development of such a deficit reduction trust fund. This is something that's been uh, fermenting and, and uh, coming along for a, number, for a while. The, the idea now is that with such a significant deficit reduction package, the American people want assurances, and justifiably so, that the money that's being that's raised either through spending cuts or tax increases, that that net uh, savings, that that is truly going to be used for deficit reduction. This puts it there. I'd like, also like to say, Madam Chair, that there's another reason that I think this is necessary. Technically, under the existing Budget Act, under the pay-go provisions, technically new money whether being raised uh, by, by tax increases particularly, or spending cuts, but particularly tax increases, technically that could be used for new spending above and beyond what was called for in the budget resolution. This walls that off. This guarantees that that won't be the case and it won't be scored for pay-go purposes in that manner, used in that manner. Mr. Brewster? All right. Yeah, Louise. That's fine. <laughs> Let me just add that uh, this bill has been mischaracterized for a long time uh, as a tax and spend bill. Uh, some of us have always believed that it was and is the largest deficit reduction bill in history. And this amendment, which takes a snapshot of the spending decisions in the bill and the revenue raising and the rest of it, makes absolutely clear that all revenues raised under the bill are isolated and spent only to reduce the deficit. In fact, to buy treasuries or to pay off treasuries of the new language in this in this amendment, and uh, that is precisely what the bill is intended to do, and it's precisely what our constituents expect. Let me just add, Madam Chair, as a new member, um, proud to be on this uh, team of five supporting this, um, this uh, whole idea is wildly popular with the freshman class, about a quarter of the Congress, and it is um, part of the, the reason that all of us were elected to change this place and to make sure that we reduce the deficit. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I do have a, a statement for the record, but I'd like to make a, a couple of oral comments. It's certainly late, and I'll try to be brief. The gentleman's uh, comments or uh, statement will be on the record. Uh, but during my 30-something town hall meetings that I've had since February, many of my constituents said, we understand the deficit and the debt are the most serious mm -hmm. problems this nation has and that they have to be addressed. Yes, we want cuts. And many would like to have more cuts than we have in this package. But they also understand that there's got to be some tax increases to make it balance also. Uh, I believe the President's plan would do that without this. But the public is skeptical. So I think it's important that we guarantee through this Deficit Reduction Trust Fund that the money raised and the cuts that are in this bill go to deficit reduction. Our plan would mean that any new spending issues have to come from cuts in existing programs. So this would lock up the cuts in this bill and mean that any new spending has to come from other programs. And I believe that that is the thing that we have to have to guarantee our constituents that we're serious about trying to do something about this deficit. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Well, you're sure welcome. And uh, certainly you have a lot of merit in what you say. And I thank you for coming and presenting it to us, Mr. Solomon. <coughs> well, Madam Chairman, uh, it's difficult to uh, to comment on, on your amendment since it was not distributed to the to the membership, but uh, uh, certainly if what you're what you're saying is uh, is true, and I assume it is, uh, uh, I certainly have uh, have sympathy for what for that effort. I, I don't quite understand though how 
putting it over here and guaranteeing that it's going to cut the deficit, how that's going to prevent we in the Congress from over here increasing spending and raising the debt. In other words, I, I understand what you're doing. You're, 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 you're cutting the, all the funds to go, to go to lower the deficit, and, and that's commendable. But there is nothing uh, as that I've seen in, in previous amendments, and uh, it's just being handed to me now, uh, that would that would lock uh, lock the Congress into to living by it. I mean, how does that happen? Uh, I would, Mr. Solomon, what it would mean is certainly Congress could create a new program or increase spending in a particular program, but they've got to cut it from money that's out there in a the current program. All it does is take the money that is raised through the taxes in this bill and take the cuts that are in the taxes in this bill, set them aside and say this is strictly for deficit reduction. If uh, you uh, or someone else propose increases in agricultural subsidies or whatever, that has to come from some other part of the existing budget. It cannot come from any revenues raised nor any cuts that are in this bill. Okay, but it, but how does it differ from from the Stenholm approach? Were you here when when well, Mr. Stenholm and that group were, were well, testifying? It's my, my understanding on the Stenholm approach. I came at the tail end. He's dealing with entitlements yeah, and the savings right. there. This has there are ramifications for that. These the two actually can marry up. They're not they're contradictory. They're not mutually exclusive. But what this does is simply just to, to say at the end of the day, when you determine how much your net savings were, it's in this fund. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck has referred to it in the past as a lockbox, and I think that's a good mm -hmm. Yeah, Jerry, let me give you an example. In this Budget Act, we cut a certain program or raise taxes, certain type of taxes. Before this trust fund, somebody under the rules of the uh, House could say, I'd like to use that money to be spent on a new program. What this proposal says is, no, that money gets put into the trust fund. And if you want to do, do a new program, you have to find additional cuts, not use the ones that were made in this Budget Act, or find new taxes to do it. So it sort of extends the PAYGO idea that we voted on in 1990, so that every year, before you can do any new spending, you must meet the deficit reduction targets through the taxes and the cuts that were in this bill. Let, let me just add that the expectation is that the end of five years we'll have deficit reduction of $496 billion under this bill, and this enforcement mechanism will make us deliver on that promise. Okay, well, you know, as in the enforcement provision in the 1990 Deficit Reduction Act didn't work at all. Because this Rules Committee just uh, arbitrarily, time after time after time, 47% of the time, just waived the Budget Act and therefore waived the, the uh, Enforcement Act. So we'll take a good hard look at what you're offering here and commend you for coming before the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. Madam Chairman, I didn't hear any of the testimony, so I have no questions. And I'm glad to see the four of you together. Mr. Goss. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I uh, think this is a, uh, a very similar concept to the one that we've heard a couple of times previous today, and I think it's good. I mean, we, we really what you're proposing, I think, is to earmark uh, funds coming from uh, savings and uh, from increased revenues uh, in a, um, uh, some type of a yet-to-be-invented uh, bulletproof vault, which is safe from the grasp of uh, Congress. Uh, I, I, and it's, it's a good idea, and it's one I'd like to see uh, uh, thought out a little more, and I think it deserves some debate time. And I hope either the McCandless approach or your approach or somebody's approach is made in order. You make a good analogy because uh, what we're trying to do is to cut down on the number of keys outstanding before the <laughs> Would the gentleman yield? Surely. I uh, just might point out to the four of you that uh, should you not be successful, uh, there, are, there is this proposal, the Stenholm proposal, a number of others, uh, some of which I'm involved with. Uh, this is the Committee of Jurisdiction, and uh, we would hope to hold hearings on this entire issue and would hope that you would uh, request that your, uh, if you put this in bill form, <clears throat> that it be assigned to this committee and we will call you in for a hearing. Appreciate you coming. Can I just add one thing, Mr. Solomon? We're, I think uh, uh, we tried to make clear we don't see this as an alternative to the Stenholm proposal. Right, right. We see this in addition to the Stenholm proposal. I understand. Right. <clears throat> His only in touch is entitlements. That's yeah. all in the world it messes with. We're talking about the whole budget. 
You might say they could marry up. Yes. I think you did. <laughs> uh, you, you said it. It's been said twice. It's great. So I, I understood. Uh, West Virginia. Right. <laughs> Somebody from Kentucky. Uh, we understand. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Our next witness is the Honorable Bart Gordon. The Honorable Bart Gordon. Mm -hmm. I had a comment for those uh, witnesses, but I will pass on my, uh, oh, it's okay, on my, uh, my testimony this time. All right. Or let me, uh, maybe, um, oh, I, I will make a quick statement. Um, you mean to do it here, Madam Chairman? I, if you come here, here, it'd be fine. I, why don't you come oh, here, here, Mark, so that, um, Since we are uh, joined today by C-SPAN, you might as well be in the line of fire, don't you think? Madam Chairman, we were at a meeting the other day where someone said they weren't called upon, but since they were, they had, they'll make a statement. Uh, or they didn't ask for recognition, <laughs> but since they were called upon, they'd make a statement. I feel the same way. Um, uh, I come before this committee with an amendment concerning the direct loan uh, program that is being proposed. Um, the situation is that there is too much uh, profit in the student loan program. Uh, and for that reason, the president came forward and said this, there's got to be changes. And I compliment him for that. Uh, he came forward with a proposal to move to a direct lending uh, program, which would save $4.2 billion uh, over a five-year period. And I think that's significant money and, and something that uh, we need to try to accomplish. Uh, I had concerns, though, that by immediately going to a direct lending program, uh, we uh, put the whole student loan program at jeopardy. Uh, and that we have a pilot program that was initiated last year and that I thought a better proposal would be to squeeze the profit out of the existing program and give the, give the pilot program a chance to work, see if it will work, and if so, uh, can it be fine-tuned. And so I put quite a bit of time and effort into developing an alternative proposal that saves more than the $4.2 billion. So uh, we have our savings. Uh, in addition, uh, it allows the pilot program to go forward. It allows the income contingency repayment plan to be a part of that. And it also allows the public service alternative and repayment to be a part of that. And so I think it's a very good, responsible bill. In addition to that, uh, it avoids setting up a, an, an enormous new bureaucracy, taking on $50 billion in new debt, uh, as well as not overburdening a Department of Education that's got their hands full cleaning up the mess uh, that, that they have now. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to get the scoring on, on, from CBO on my plan until after the committee had already had their markup. Uh, and so I was not able to uh, make that a part of the, of the markup. Uh, I had intended to bring that today before this committee. However, I think that it's probably unlikely that there's going to be um, small amendments, I guess, what, although $4 billion is no small amount, uh, but amendments that are less than an alternative to the overall package. And, and for that reason, I have decided uh, that there will be another opportunity during the appropriations process where I can come forward uh, and like on a number of areas that I want to try to strike or uh, remove uh, spending from the program. And I will come back at that time during the appropriate uh, appropriations process to offer this as an alternative. And I hope that we'll have a chance to work together at that time to improve this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. You're making no request then from the committee no. this time. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Did you want to? All right. Really would, uh, Louisa. Certainly. Well, sure, it's different being out here. You know, you're all a lot higher. I'm down like this. <laughs> I, I, I see the majesty now. Now you know the, the intimidation. The committee, yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Bart, I just want to tell you, I'm very much interested in what, uh, in, in your, uh, your program. Um, I have a lot of concerns that going to a direct loan will really result in any kind of savings or efficiency. Uh, the private sector usually does most things better. And uh, uh, I just uh, hope that you're going to pursue your... Uh, uh, your your ideas because I think they have a lot of merit, and uh, we really be, we ought, be, ought, should be awfully careful in in jumping into something that we just don't know about. And uh, uh, hopefully you will lead that charge, and I hopefully we can be there to help you. Uh, for a while we were in the hypothetical. Now we're in the specific. I have a specific bill of which I hope that you'll have a chance to look at and welcome your co-sponsorship. And as I say, we will have an opportunity at a later date to introduce that 
and hopefully make that as a responsible alternative. Appreciate you coming. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. The Honorable Porter Goss. Mr. Quillen, you want to make yes, a comment? Yes, I do. I commend Mr. you, uh, Mark Gordon. I think the president's proposal won't work. The colleges have called my office, and they don't want to be in the lending business. I think that the financial institutions of this country can do a better job. Personally, I'd like to see it left alone like it is, rather than going to the president's proposal. I don't know what your substitute's going to be when we come to the appropriation process. But I understood that you were going to have an amendment to leave it like it is. Yes, sir. What, basically, what I would do would be leave it as it is now. Uh, there was a pilot program that was voted on and, and approved by this House uh, Congress last year. And uh, I think that it's, you know, it, it's worth going ahead and letting the pilot program go forward and seeing if there is any worth there. Uh, but uh, I certainly don't think we should jump into a new program. My feeling is that uh, if it can be done in the private sector in, anywhere close to the same uh, savings, then certainly we don't want to, to uh, bring on a whole new bureaucracy. And the CBO has scored my plan uh, uh, really in a comparable situation. So we're going to save money in, under, both, under both plans. Well, I commend you, Mark. Really. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Certainly. Porter, did you have a comment you want to make? Not at all. I do echo the comments. I'm very concerned about changing the system and jumping the frying pan into the fire, and I, I, I'm heartened by your words, and I look forward to the product. Well, I hope that you'll have a chance to, to maybe sign on. I might quickly tell you that uh, the United Negro College Fund has concerns about changing. Uh, Vanderbilt, Middle Tennessee State University, a number of the schools in my area, as I'm sure in your area. Uh, the Southern uh, Financial Assistance Association have said that. Uh, the consumer groups, the New York Times, Washington Post, have all editorialized about, uh, you know, go slow on this. So I think you're seeing a great deal of national support, and we'll, we'll fight that battle soon. Well, no, that we've got an anxiety level that started because of all that uh, visibility as well, and I think we really are under the gun to produce a little bit, and I'm delighted to hear you're responding. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness will be uh, Porter Goss. And Bart, let me yield the chair to you. Musical chairs. We'll trade compliments. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a 15-page statement for the record, which I would like to have included. No objections. It will be introduced. Uh, and in the interest of brevity, I think uh, after this long day, I can summarize very quickly. Uh, I have a proposed amendment which uh, basically knocks out the BTU tax, the energy tax, <coughs> knocks out the Social Security tax and replaces that $104 billion uh, with $104 billion worth of cuts or rescissions or offsets, if you will. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the list of, uh, of cuts is about a billion dollars more than the, uh, than the revenues uh, would be foregone by cutting off the energy tax and the Social Security tax, so it's a safe number. The way I've done the cuts is I've got a list of 24, uh, all of which have been submitted to the Budget Committee before and in another form. I've been submitted to the White House before in another form. Uh, and they have been submitted to the Parliamentarian, and so they were presented as a list on block, uh, as the Parliamentarian has requested. Of the 24, 18 have been scored by CBO, and the numbers are reflective on the list. The six remaining that are not scored uh, have in fact been sent to CBO and they are having some problems I understand uh, because the scoring of uh, some of these discretionary programs in the out years which are the moving target uh, is very hard for them to conform to their static models they use but uh, in any event we have had other scoring on those six projects from what I think are credible sources credible organizations I think they're very conservative and I have no doubt that we can more than meet the uh, revenue question, and I, would, I am very comfortable in saying that the en bloc list is in fact revenue neutral or in fact uh, perhaps slightly revenue positive. 
Um, I think that it is important that uh, there has been confusion on this question of when a, a waiver for the Budget Act is needed and is not needed on non-entitlement uh, offsets. Uh, we have conflicting opinion uh, in our uh, discussion uh, with the um, parliamentarian on this matter, and we received conflicting advice to some other I have heard today. Uh, it doesn't matter because we proceeded in good reliance and it doesn't change the merit of anything I'm doing. And the question of waivers is not a new issue here. We have waivers 47 percent of the time, 43, 47, some 47 percent of the time, I guess, for these types of matters. So it's a big number, about half the time. In fact, I gather we have some on the floor right now, if I'm not mistaken. So what I've tried to do is find another uh, alternative um, program for the debate uh, for a slightly different formula. We've had the Michael Snow Amendment, which uh, deals uh, with the energy tax. We've had the Archer, which deals with the Social Security and several others uh, that uh, are around the edges. Mine is very specific. Uh, it, uh, it just simply gets rid of those taxes and replaces them with what I think are a good list of cuts. Not everybody is going to agree with that list, and I welcome them to come up with their own list en bloc. But I think this is exactly the kind of message that we are receiving from our district, and in fact, outside our district as well. Uh, when I put out the first list of cuts uh, that I did in response to President Clinton's challenge uh, to be specific about cuts back before we even had the Kasich budget to offer, um, I got a tremendous amount of response across the country on it, unbelievable. Uh, and people didn't agree with all my cuts, but they were very glad that somebody was listening to the concept of cutting spending first and at least examining some of these programs which may not measure up quite as well as some of their sponsors think they might. So I have tried to respond with what I think is an amendment that uh, gives us more of what America needs and gives us more of what America wants. Uh, and I know I won't have full agreement, but I certainly believe should I have the opportunity to bring it to the floor. Uh, for debate. Uh, that is my request, that the amendment be made in order uh, with waivers as appropriate if they're necessary. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goss, I had a similar situation as you earlier in submitting a number of cuts to the White House. I was pleased that uh, quite a few of those were accepted and, and put in, into their budget, but I think there's still more that can be done. Over the last few years, uh, I have worked with coalitions to try to to cut out the space station, the superconductor, super collider, raise the, the uh, grazing fees and some, some unneeded military projects. And uh, uh, we won a couple of those, but un we were, didn't quite get the brass ring on a lot of them. But I feel that there's going to be a new attitude this year. I think there's going to be some good bipartisan coalitions uh, created. And I think during this appropriation process, we're going to have the opportunity uh, to strike uh, a number of programs that that, that aren't completely useless, but just don't meet the high priority right now that exactly. justifies those expenses. And, I, and I, uh, I think you did a very thoughtful job in presenting yours. I noticed I went through those, I guess it was three months ago or four months ago. You, you were an early one, and I've seen them at that time. That's correct. Uh, I did a total list is not included, only partial, but uh, some of the hits in Florida are still on the list. I want to make sure that everybody understands that I have not uh, looked at this from a parochial view, but from a national view. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Porter, uh, your, uh, your proposed amendment knocks out the energy tax in total, and it uh, knocks out the proposed uh, increased tax on Social Security benefits, and it replaces it with spending cuts. If your amendment were to be voted on on the floor, without question, that amendment would overwhelmingly pass. That's all you'd have to do is take uh, those members who have issued press releases opposing the BTU tax and opposing the Social Security tax, and if you added them up, it would probably come to 250 or 260 members. Um, I just hope you get the opportunity to offer that amendment on the floor, which would be overwhelmingly accepted by this Congress uh, and the American people. Thank you. Appreciate you coming before us. Ms. Slaughter, did you have any? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have a question for Mr. Goss. I just want to echo what you had said before, that we have uh, 
work very hard in coalitions trying to make some of these cuts and, and commend Mr. Goss as well. For his I appreciate service. that. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Order, I think that you, your amendment is one of the best that's been all. The people are almost unanimously against the BTU tax. And I think if you have the cuts that come in and zero in to replace the loss, that there is no reason at all that it shouldn't be brought to the floor of the house. And I commend you because I, that's what we need is an up or down vote and your amendment would give us that opportunity. So I hope this committee in its judgment makes it in order. And why not? Can't think of a reason. There's no reason that they shouldn't. I mean the, the uh, BTU tax is inflationary going to cost more money than uh, has, uh, has been testified in other fields and it brings in. So to me, your amendment makes sense. And thank you. And incidentally, you and Bart look a little different down there at the table than you do up here. Still looking sound good, though. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness will be uh, the Honorable John Spratt from South Carolina. Glad to have you with us, John. Mr. Chairman, I am appearing here on behalf of the Committee on Government Operations, and in particular on behalf of our Chairman, John Conyers, who is on the floor just now and asked me to make this appearance in this behalf as well as on behalf of the committee as a whole. Do you have a statement you'd like to place in the record? I do have some things that I want to place in the record and they'll be brought in here shortly. Uh, specifically, I would like to ask that the Committee on Rules consider adding as legislative text provisions that would extend existing budget process rules and through fiscal year 98 by first extending a single cap for all appropriations spending Second, by extending the PAYGO scorecard requiring changes in tax and entitlement policies, requiring them to be deficit neutral. And I would ask that this text be made in order uh, by the rule as original text, as base text. As you know, under House Rule 10J, 101J1 and 2, the Committee on Government Operations has jurisdiction over budget and accounting measures other than appropriations and the overall economy and efficiency of government operations and activities. On May 13th, our committee heard testimony on the budget process provisions that I will present to the committee. And while the committee had scheduled a markup for these same provisions on May the 20th, after conferring with the leadership of the House, our chairman, Mr. Conyers, decided that we would have to cancel the markup because of unresolved issues within the leadership and within our caucus relating to the entitlement cap proposal and relating also to the exact provisions for establishment of the so-called deficit reduction trust fund. That is one of the texts that I'll also present and ask be made part of the base text of this bill. Scheduling considerations for floor consideration of the budget reconciliation bill have made it difficult for us to reschedule markup. It's clear, however, the chairman tells me from a poll of committee members that there is support for extension of the existing enforcement rules under the Budget Enforcement Act and for the opposition to the establishment of just a fixed and arbitrary cap on entitlements. It's clear, and this is Chairman Conyers speaking, that increased expenditures in health care entitlements alone almost solely explain for the deficit increase beyond what was negotiated in the FY90 uh, budget enforcement agreement, but that problem can't be and that that problem can't be adequately addressed without fundamental health care reform. So he feels that an arbitrary entitlement cap would severely aggravate economic conditions in the event we had another recession and we had a corresponding increase in beneficiary population as a result of the downturn in the economy and would unfairly and arbitrarily deny benefits that are deserved to senior citizens, veterans, farmers, Medicare and Medicaid recipients, and many other beneficiaries of entitlement programs. 
I have advocated, as many of you know, a, an entitlement cap proposal, which the chairman also supports. It's a modified version of an entitlement review, which would allow for entitlement baseline to be established and would allow for annual tracking of this and would require both the president and the Congress to deal with uh, adjustments and entitlement expenditures over and above the baseline that we set for ourselves. Such a procedure would be useful in requiring us to deal with the single most significant problem that confronts us in resolving the deficit. It's not discretionary spending, it's entitlement spending. That's the missing element in this whole puzzle. It's a gaping hole in the budget process. And so one of the provisions that I will submit to you is, is the proposal that is it's currently drafted for capping entitlement, so to speak. It's really a, not a cap, but it's a means of uh, controlling direct spending as defined by the Budget Enforcement Act. I would caveat the submission that I am handing up to the committee by saying that uh, we are still negotiating provisions that deal with the reconciliation of Medicare and Medicaid, specifically with the Committee on Energy and Commerce, as to whether or not that they would uh, have the authority to present broader provisions than just cost cuts, but also broad cost controls and measures for restraining the growth of expenditures in the public and private health care sectors. We're still negotiating language to that, and the majority leader or the speaker may present additional revisions to what I am submitting uh, in order to conform to the uh, agreement we reached with the Energy and Commerce Committee. The administration has also proposed, as you know, the establishment of a deficit reduction trust fund, which would place savings generated by budget reconciliation and not otherwise obligated for investment in a so-called trust account which could be used only to reduce the deficit. There are some concerns in our committee that this account is merely symbolic. It does serve one significant purpose, and that is we need to establish in the keeping of the scorecard under the Budget Enforcement Act that the monies that are generated by this reconciliation bill and identified for deficit reduction will not be entered as a credit on the scorecard so that they would be used, usable in the future, to offset the cost of entitlement expansions or tax decreases. And so it serves that legitimate purpose. It also serves the symbolic purpose of saying this amount of money is dedicated through fiscal reduction and nothing else. I would advise caution. Chairman Conyers asked me to make this statement about making other enforcement amendments in order. Most of these have not been through the committee for consideration and have not been reviewed to protect against uh, inadvertent technical and procedural problems. I have the text of this. Yeah, the text that we are offering the committee for inclusion. Oh, we've, it's been distributed. Oh, it has been distributed to you. I beg your pardon. Okay. I had it in my hand a minute ago. But the three things that we have submitted then we would request be made part of the base text of the rule, of the bill by virtue of the rule. John, as a uh, thoughtful member of both the uh, government operations and a long-term member of the budget committee, you're in a unique position to bring forward, I think, conscientious uh, improvements to uh, uh, sometime what we think of as almost a crazy quilt operation within these procedures and um, uh, I'm very much in line with your suggestions hope that they are being worked out and that we'll have those as a part of this uh, bill uh, tomorrow thank you and uh, Mr. Solomon <laughs> Mr. Chairman first of all uh, Spratt knows I have uh, a lot of respect for he and, and his mutual uh, and his lovely wife uh, as well and uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very disturbed by what's what's happening here we're being given uh, just 15 minutes ago, here's a 50-page document, a uh, couple of page document. Uh, there's three documents and there's one missing. There's no subtitle B here at all. And, you know, our committee, the Rules Committee, has uh, equal jurisdiction over these issues. And we don't know the first thing about this. Uh, it's laid on our desk here after 11 hours of, of hearings. And we're expected to make some kind of reasonable uh, uh, decision over, over what to allow here. We had Mr. Stenholm coming in a few minutes ago, who I have great respect for, too, and who did the same thing. And uh, I'm just going to take this opportunity, because I'm getting a little uh, uh, exercised over this, this thing at this late hour. Uh, I'm going to just read this editorial again, which is similar to the uh, Wall Street Journal and the Mary McGrory, uh, the columnist's article. And uh, it just says, the Democratic leadership of the House of Representatives is used to getting its way 
not in the least part because it has a stranglehold on the legislative process in the lower house. If a rule is brought forward, there will probably be some provision to allow the Republicans to offer an alternative package. But again, tricky games with the rules allow the Democrats to keep the Republicans from getting an honest vote on the alternative of their choice. The Rules Committee has told Republican leaders that any alternative will have to comply with the Budget Control and Impoundment Act of 1974. The act requires that the offsets in, you know, uh, the offset any tax increase, cuts may become only from entitlement spending. And it goes on to say that this, that prevents the GOP from trying to get rid of Mr. Clinton's tax increases by substituting cuts in discretionary spending. In other words, the Rules Committee has told Republicans that they can offer a plan different from the President's, but to do it, they have to offer cuts in such politically volatile areas as Social Security, Medicare, uh, doing away with uh, uh, other uh, very, very <coughs> controversial issues, but not at all allowing us to offer cuts in Mohair subsidies and the likes uh, uh, in discretionary spending. And it goes on to say the Democrats in the House regularly waive the institution's rules when it is in their interest, but uh, becomes uh, punctilious when it allows them to force Republicans into a no-win corner. And this thing just sort of is getting out of order with all these, uh, these amendments being laid on us at the, this late hour. It's not right. It's not the way to, uh, that we should be functioning. Uh, we should, if we're going to do it this way, we should open this up to an open rule uh, so that the seven or eight Democrats like yourself uh, who have come before us and want uh, good, germane, uh, significant amendments to be offered. They ought to be allowed to offer those and debate them and let the chips fall where they may uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, I think this is the wrong way to go about this. Mr. Spratt, I would probably, if I had the opportunity to really digest all of this, would, uh, I would probably be commending you for your effort. I don't think it carries the hammer that the Stenholm uh, approach does, but it, uh, it probably is a step in the right direction. But uh, it's the wrong way to do business. You know it, and everybody in this room knows it. Well, Mr. Solomon, in response, Subtitle B, I believe, is the product of the uh, Rules Committee's own efforts, and I think the Rules Committee will be developing the text of it. Uh, <laughs> as for subtitles, the other subtitles, the budget enforcement extension provisions were submitted to you at 12 o'clock today, and Mr. Sabo testified early in the day about them. Uh, as for the provisions, for the entitlement cap, I'm responsible for that. We are negotiating them this very hour. So I brought you a text, and it could very well be that the leadership will be coming back to seek further revisions of it. But under the circumstances, uh, this is as expeditious as we could be. Well, uh, again, there's a breakdown in communications because these three documents were handed to us 15 minutes ago, uh, just so you know. But I appreciate you coming before us. I know you're sincere, and I... Uh, I commend you for your efforts. Thank you, sir. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're all getting very weary, and I see we have a, some more uh, witnesses. And I appreciate your coming, and I appreciate your testimony. But, Mr. Chairman, can we group some of these witnesses? I mean, we're going to wear everybody out before we even get to a, a vote on the rule, and hopefully we won't get to that vote on the rule. I hope we just bury this chicken and uh, maybe chop off its head before we bury it. But nevertheless, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Mr. Goss, do you have any chickens you want to bury over there? No, I, not at this time, but I would like to. I'd like to eat one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mr. Spratt, I appreciate you coming forward, and I realize the difficult circumstances that you're uh, toiling in the vineyards uh, under, and I appreciate and I hope you understand that we have a little frustration on our side, too. That doesn't detract from the effort you're making. So thank you. If you make the mohair and honey uh, amendment order, I'll vote with you. <laughs> it's thank in you my amendment. Remember that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Spratt. We all appreciate you your much. thoughtful approach here. Uh, the Honorable Leslie Byrne. And I'm, um, let, me, let me just for, uh, let me call out the list that I have here and see if there are people that's, that have um, uh, amendments together and we will have a panel if that's the case. Um, uh, the Honorable Leslie Byrne, Eric Fingerhut, Peter Dooch, and Nathan Deal. 
Is that pretty much do it? Do any of you uh, want to testify together? Oh, I'm sorry, and we have uh, Dan Burton too. So yeah, there should be any panels. Okay, well he gets around. He testifies a lot. All right, uh, this is uh, Leslie Byrne. I'm Leslie Byrne from Northern Virginia. We're glad to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will try to make this as short and painless for the committee as possible. This is a pretty straightforward amendment. And what it does is strike uh, a little kicker in this bill uh, on the amortization of goodwill. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, tomorrow we're going to be asked to, to do a very hard vote. We're going to ask people to sacrifice and tackle the deficit by increasing their taxes on Social Security and income and energy. This budget reconciliation package also has a reward to those people who I like to call merger maniacs. Tucked away in this uh, package is an item that was not part of the President's original plan, and that's the amortization of intangible property to include goodwill. According to the Joint Tax Committee estimate for a similar proposal, the federal government would lose significant revenues after a six-year uh, out period because uh, of the provisions for including goodwill. That's in the DSG report. I took further action and checked today, and they stand behind it, it will lose revenues. We asked CRS for an evaluation of how much it would lose. Uh, they estimate $2 billion. And I guess what I'm here before the committee today to do is ask you to consider how can we ask our citizens to sacrifice and then turn around and in the same bill, the same bill, gentlemen, allow this tax benefit to those who gobble up other companies, cannibalize them, and lose jobs. If the 80s taught us anything, it is that we should not reward behavior that loses jobs for the American people. This isn't only bad tax policy, it is bad politics. That's why I bring this amendment before you. I would ask that the committee uh, make the amendment in order with waivers. Ms. Byrne, is this your first um, uh, appearance before the Rules Committee? Yes, sir. We welcome you here. I thought this was your first. Uh, although a new member, you've certainly brought uh, energy and, and intelligence uh, to this um, uh, Congress. And I'm, we're, we're glad you're here with us today and appreciate your thoughtful testimony. I appreciate but, it. Mr. Solomon? I just concur in the uh, acting chairman's comments, and uh, thank you for coming before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, uh, explain uh, the uh, amortization of goodwill. It is based on a court case that was decided by the Supreme Court that included intangible property that we could amortize just as we do in business, tangible property like buildings and phones, the value of lists, software, things that have uh, an ephemeral value can be amortized. What this package, what this piece of uh, legislation has done is expand that definition beyond what the Supreme Court was al said allowable. The Supreme Court said that businesses could take uh, customer lists, even though they're intangible of value, and amortize them over a 14-year period. What the Ways and Means Committee did was expand that definition to include goodwill. Uh, the name of a company, for example, if I bought Baskin and Robbins, which sounds pretty good right now, uh, since we're all so hungry, uh, that I would not only own that company, but I would own that name and I could amortize the goodwill of that name uh, over a 14-year period. It is uh, a tax benefit to those who buy companies. Uh, it is a tax benefit to those who may want to sell that name to another company. It gives it a, as an asset. And it's, it, may not, it may not be bad on its own, but what it does in this bill is it sends up a message that we want to talk about deficit reduction and sacrifice, and yet we are rewarding in the same breath the kind of activities that we saw in the 80s, where companies gobbled other companies, cannibalized them, sold them off for parts, 
and are using the term goodwill as part of that activity. I can see what, where you're coming from, but uh, I must say that I don't agree with you. I remember when we had the uh, savings and loan uh, bailout. The agreement was made by the Federal Home Loan Bank to allow healthy savings and loans by failing savings alone, and that they could amortize goodwill over a certain period of years. The Congress absolutely changed that, and the government didn't live up to its obligation. So I'm glad that they have in this bill, although I'm going to vote against it, uh, the provision of amortizing goodwill. I don't like the government to break its word, a written contract, or written letters, and then uh, renege. So legislatively, I think it's a good idea to put it in writing, however good or however bad it might be. But I thank you for coming. Thank you, you have Mr. brightened the whole day for all of us. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Tony Bielinson. Thank you. Mr. Goss, again, thank you for coming. Your experience in the Virginia legislature has certainly been demonstrated here. We uh, appreciate your testimony. Another new member that has uh, gotten off to a fast start is Honorable Eric Fingerhut. Uh, I've worked with him in a number of things already, so I know he's in the thick of it. Glad you're here to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I also appreciate, uh, as uh, Mr. Quillen and others noted, that it's late and you've heard a variety of, uh, of uh, testimony all day, so I'll be very brief. Do you have a, I also, you have a statement you'd like to place well, on the record? Well, I, I don't at this time. Okay. I, I do have a document that summarizes the amendments I'll propose. I'll distribute. I apologize for the form not being proper, but as you know, it's been a fluid day for, uh, for a lot of people, and I will get you appropriate form. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I would like to address uh, two issues related to the, the proposed BTU tax. Uh, I, the first on simply the size of the tax. Uh, I have uh, deep concern about this issue, as, as do a number of uh, members who come from uh, industrialized states where we rely on heavy manufacturing, which is uh, very energy intensive. Uh, I also, however, uh, have tried to recognize the fact uh, that uh, this is a body that requires compromise uh, and that there are, uh, th that while we may all wish to have comprehensive sweeping changes uh, that would satisfy us, uh, that is not always possible at every particular time in the process. Uh, however, uh, one decision that was made by the Ways and Means Committee, I believe, merits re-examination. The President proposed in his plan to raise the corporate income tax from 34 to 36 uh, percent. The committee, in its wisdom, uh, decided to raise the tax only from 34 to 35 percent uh, and to use the, uh, that additional 1 percent increment, which uh, amounts to $15 billion, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, I believe that uh, a better use uh, of uh, a better way of providing relief uh, to our manufacturing industrial sector would be to have retained the President's original proposal of a 36 percent corporate income tax and to use that additional 15 billion dollar increment to offset some of the cost of the BTU tax. Now mind you, my first uh, uh, choice would be to not have the BTU tax, but I believe it's our responsibility in this body to try and uh, craft a proposal that in fact can pass tomorrow uh, and also uh, to address the legitimate needs of this country to reduce the deficit. And I believe the President has in good faith tried to do that by making his energy proposal. Uh, but I would recommend uh, that we revisit this one decision. I believe it was not, uh, frankly, one that would have been shared by uh, the majority of the caucus if, uh, uh, and of the body if we were able to revisit it. Uh, a second element second element that is contained in the same proposed amendment uh, is one that I believe you, this committee has previously heard about, uh, and that is uh, the proposal by Representative Wise of West Virginia uh, to establish an energy tax evaluation commission. Uh, there is, as you know, Mr. Chairman, a lot of discussion about 
how this tax would impact on our basic manufacturing base. I don't believe that the President uh, or the Congress desires to do any legitimate harm to those industries. I believe that Representative Wise has made a wise proposal uh, to set up a formal mechanism in the law uh, by which uh, those of us who find ourselves in a position with industries that are personally and directly affected uh, can initiate a process to evaluate it. Uh, my opinion is that while it doesn't go as far as I would like, that combining uh, the relief on the BTU tax uh, that I propose uh, with Representative Wise's proposal uh, will go a long way uh, towards meeting the concerns, again, not all the way, but a long way, and I propose it as an alternative that I would like the House to be able to consider. The second piece of uh, paper that you've been distributed is a proposed Second Amendment, uh, and like uh, Congresswoman Burns' amendment before me, it deals with a rather technical provision uh, of the bill, uh, which has frankly not received a great deal of attention, uh, but which has caused me a great uh, uh, consternation. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee added a section of 14241 to the bill, uh, which essentially permitted uh, utility companies to pass the cost of the BTU tax directly on to the consumer, bypassing state regulatory bodies whose job it is uh, to review the charges that privately owned monopolies uh, pass on to consumers and to determine whether they are in fact the appropriate charges. Mr. Chairman, obviously I have uh, most direct experience in my own state of Ohio. Uh, in that state we have a Public Utilities Commission uh, which has a long and very credible history uh, of providing an open forum for utility companies in determining what charges are necessary to be passed on to consumers. We have an Office of a Consumers Council whose job it is to come in and represent the consumer's interest uh, and assure that that interest is fully heard. And quite often, uh, neither side goes away happy, but both sides realize that they have been heard. I believe it is a very dangerous precedent uh, for this Congress uh, to, to uh, by law, uh, denote that, uh, that any industry, uh, particularly uh, the monopoly that exists in private electric utilities in this country uh, should be able to bypass state regulatory agencies uh, and I recommend a second amendment uh, that contains language that would delete that specific provision of the bill. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. I know you've had a long day and you have a uh, difficult task ahead of you in sorting through all of these options, but I do believe that uh, these would be good options to present to the body tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Finger, for that thoughtful uh, presentation. Let me put uh, Mr. Dill, Mr. Dooch, and Mr. Uh, Burton on notice that if we can, we'll try to finish this before the vote, but we won't hold you to where you're going to miss a vote. Uh, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions, but I notice the lady before you uh, was against the amortization of uh, goodwill for an important name. Finger Hut just opened a great uh, wholesale warehouse in my district, and I, I wonder if that is your company. Uh, Mr. Quillen, uh, indeed it is not. Uh, I have tried to claim them uh, as relations ever since I entered the political arena, uh, and they don't seem to be willing to accept me as family. Uh, but if you have now a direct connection to them by virtue of their business in your district, I'd appreciate an introduction, sir. <laughs> Mr. Bielenson. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bielenson. <laughs> Mr. Goss. Very quickly, just a point of information for you. You may want to know that somebody's already claimed uh, some of that money that uh, you're planning to use here in another amendment today, which is perfectly all right. That happens to money around this town. Um, the, the question I wanted to know is how strongly do you feel about this BTU tax? Um, Mr. Goss, I. Uh, I feel that uh, that it is something that would be best avoided if we could, uh, but I also feel very strongly about deficit reduction uh, and believe that this package goes a long way towards that. I also feel very strongly about the fact that this is a diverse country, as is represented by the diversity of this body, and then occasionally we don't get everything we want. Uh, and so uh, what I have proposed here, I believe, is a compromise that ought to be acceptable to people of goodwill on both sides of this issue. Well, I certainly think it's a very, very fair compromise. You've articulated your position very uh, straightforwardly and uh, very understandably. Uh, if, if we can't make it in order, will you still be able to support the rule? 
Well, I will have to uh, see what the rule looks like before I make that decision. That's a fair point. Thank you. We're going to give you a good look at it soon. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've got, we're going to maybe get two for one here, Mr. Dooch, Mr. Deal, if um, you'd like to step forward, and then we'll finish up with Mr. Burton and try to make our vote here. Deutsch, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Godin. Yes. <laughs> well said. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we were hoping we were going to be last, and I guess we were hoping saving the last for best, so I guess we won't be last. But uh, uh, <laughs> I think I've already lost it at this point. Um, but uh, we have uh, two amendments that, that we're introducing together, along with several other um, sponsors, uh, uh, Congressman Klein and, and uh, uh, Congressman uh, Ensley. And I think what these amendments do, and they're separate amendments, is really frame the issue um, for the Congress, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, the First Amendment deals with the BTU tax, and really it, would, it specifically would completely eliminate the BTU tax and uh, direct us to find that amount of money in discretionary spending. Uh, and it gives us that opportunity, which I think the public, as well as I think a majority of the members of Congress, would like to see happen, which is for us to cut first before we um, start trying to tax. And right now, the the way the BTU tax is in front of us, it is truly a consumer tax um, that uh, I think a lot of members and, uh, as well as the public uh, has a real concern about. And, and this amendment, and as I said, two separate amendments, really have the ability to frame the issue. Are we willing to cut um, to deal with the deficit issue, which is a national security as well as an economic security issue for this country? So I concur in those comments, and I'll just be very brief to say that uh, in my district and I think in my state that the BTU tax is certainly viewed as the most onerous portion of this proposed plan, and if we can offset that with additional spending cuts, it is a much more desirable approach. Mr. Dorch and Mr. Deal, we recognize that the brevity of your um, remarks is not related to its importance, but rather to the lateness of the time, and we do appreciate uh, Mr. Balenson. I, I, I won't say anything, I guess, Mr. Chairman, but in all seriousness, other people who've come before us today from both sides when, they've, when they wish to get rid of one tax or do something else have suggested to us, you know, what, what would be substituted for it? I mean, how we'd make up that money. And I take it you're just saying that we should take it from discretionary spending, period, but you don't... You don't well, we have, a, we we have a list um, of over the $110 billion that would be required. Um, these amendments were drafted by the Legislative Council's office, and we were told that the correct way to draft them was, in fact, not to designate those particular items within, okay. the, um, okay. within the budget. So uh, we have a list of, of budgets that, as, as a group um, of four individual members that are on these bills that, that we've come up with. But again, uh, Legislative Council and CBO have said this is the way that the amendment is technically correct. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Quillen? No question. Mr. Goss? I'd like to congratulate my colleague from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for coming forward on the sentiment particularly, and uh, I hope you too will uh, be able to share the sentiment that uh, if, this, uh, if this rule does not make an order debate on this very important subject that you would not be able to support it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that's really where the issue is coming, and we aren't going to get it unless we get that kind of expression. Um, Ms. Chairman, let me also just mention that a separate amendment deals with the Social Security tax in the same way. Again, thank you for your testimony, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Dale, do you have a uh, close? Mr. Chairman, I have uh, two separate, very brief amendments okay. on my own, <clears throat> and I will do it very briefly okay. if the chair will allow That's it. That's fine, certainly. Uh, mine relate to uh, the fees that have been authorized under both public works and natural resources to be charged uh, on Corps of Engineer Lake projects. The two amendments address those two separate sections. I'm told by CBO that this is a non-fiscal issue and they do not anticipate revenue from these. It simply builds in language that says that the boat ramps that are not mechanized and not improved would not be included in the fee uh, collection schedule. Uh, that apparently is what is intended, but they are not specifically exempt, and I would provide in this language exemptions in both public works and natural resources portion of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Dill. I'm glad to have my neighbor from uh, Georgia testifying today. I can't think of a better way to close off this long day hearings than to hear from Mr. Burton. Uh, your old buddy. <laughs> we can just get you to get past your shyness and come forward. I'm going to talk real fast, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, although this is not a major revenue raiser, Mr. Chairman, I believe it can help. Uh, it hits the wealthy, which is where many in the House of Representatives thinks the tax burden should be levied. And uh, we've done this before with the luxury tax on boats and planes, etc. And so I believe that people who can afford uh, a haircut in excess of $100 should be able to pay a 10% luxury tax for that haircut. And I think, as I said before, it's a revenue enhancer. It's not a major raiser, but it will be helpful in reducing the deficit and paying for the reconciliation bill. And I hope you'll look with favor upon this amendment. Thank you. Mr. Quillen uh, pointed out to me earlier that looking at your haircut, he, he didn't think that uh, you would be qualifying for uh, uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Quillen, <laughs> I just, no, I, I obviously, just, just kidding. I, I obviously spend a lot less than two hundred dollars for my hair. Just, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Quillen, any other comments or Mr. Goss? I think that's a 